Good morning and welcome back to the December 2022 20, uh, quarterly board meeting of the Medical Board of California. It's nice to see all of you uh, again. I'd like to ask the board members uh, and everyone here that's here with us in the hearing room to please turn any electronic devices to silent. You may notice that board members are accessing their laptops, their phones, or other devices during the course of this meeting. They are using those devices to access board meeting materials that are in electronic format. Government Code Section 11126.5 does allow a board to remove people who willfully interrupt a meeting and to clear the room if order cannot be restored by removing the disruptive people. If you're a member of the media and you require assistance or information, please do see the board's public information manager, Carlos Viatoro. He's standing here in the back. We will have a designated time on the agenda for public comment on each agenda item. This is a an official business meeting of the Medical Board of California, and as such, disruptions of the board's business will not be tolerated. The board will welcome comment on any item on the agenda, and it's the, board intent to, it's the board's intent to ask for public comments prior to the board taking action on any agenda item. If for some reason I forget to call for public comments on an agenda item and you wish to speak on that item, please do just raise your hand uh, or come forward and you will be recognized. I would like to request all speakers to please uh, complete a presenter slip so that I can call you by name at the appropriate time and so that the record of the meeting can be full and complete. However, this is voluntary. Please give the speaker uh, slips to Ms. Lopez, who's sitting over here to my right, um, and I will do my best to call upon everyone who supplied a slip for the agenda item and recognize any of you who wish to make a last minute comment as well. This meeting is also available via teleconference. Individuals listening to the meeting will have an opportunity to provide public comment and will be assisted by a moderator who will be facilitating the teleconferencing process. For those members of the public participating via teleconference, please wait until the moderator has introduced you before you make your comments. To request to make a comment during the public comment period, press star one. You will hear a tone indicating that you're in the queue for comment. And if you change your mind and do not wish to make a comment, press star two. Assistance will be available to you throughout the teleconference meeting, and to request a specialist, please press star zero. Only one public comment per agenda item will be allowed per attendee, and I'd like to remind all speakers to please stay on topic and keep your comments to the allotted time or less. Today's meeting will be run according to the Open Meeting Act as required by law. We do plan to end today at 2 p.m., by 2 p.m., excuse me. I would like to now call the meeting to order. Uh, it is 9.12 a.m. here in Los Angeles. Ms. Lopez, please call the roll. Dr. Balat. Here. Mr. Brooks. Dr. Hawkins. Here. Dr. Helzer. Here. Ms. Shong. Ms. Shong? She's not here. Oh, yeah. Oh. And Ms. Lubiano. Here. Dr. Mahmood. Mr. Mr. Rue. Dr. Sai. Here. Dr. Thorpe. Here. Mr. Watkins. Yeah. Dr. Palat. Here. Ms. Lawson. Here. And thank you, a quorum is present. Uh, I would like to remind members again that on any action items, we'll be taking a roll call vote uh, as well. We're now gonna move on uh, to our first agenda item of the day, agenda item 16, which is a presentation on overcoming health inequities in LGBTQ plus communities, implications for CME. And I would like to first briefly introduce our speakers. Jonathan Cook is dedicated to serving the LGBTQ plus community. He spent the last 10 years dedicating his career in the service of others through the nonprofit sector. His experience working with LGBTQ plus community includes supporting LGBTQ plus youth, seniors, people living with HIV AIDS, community mental health, public policy advocacy, and promoting international human rights. Welcome, uh, Mr. Cook. We also have Dr. Sergio Aguilar Gaxiola, who is a professor of clinical internal medicine at the School of Medicine at UC Davis. He's the founding director of the UC Davis Center for Redu Reducing Health Disparities and the director of community engagement program of the Clinical Translational Science Center, among many other accomplishments. Dr. Aguilar Gaxiola's applied research program has focused on identifying unmet health and mental health needs and associated risk and protective factors to better understand and meet population health and mental health needs and achieve equity in, mental, in health and mental health disparities in underserved populations. More complete bios for our esteemed speakers are included in the uh, board packet. 
But without further delay, I'd like to welcome our speakers and thank them for being with us today. Mr. Cook is appearing here with us in person in Los Angeles, and Dr. Aguilar Gaxiola is appearing by phone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning. And thank you, uh, President Lawson. Can you hear me? We sure can hear you, Dr. Aguilar Gaxiola. Thank you. Thank We're going to be getting the presentation uh, set up here on the screen here in just a second. Okay. You can provide public comment on the agenda items. No, I know, but usually we start the second meeting with another session of open comment. Just once at the beginning of the, the meeting for this meeting. No, usually the first day and the second day have open comment. Mr. Andrus, we're not starting today with additional public comment. So we all spent time preparing that. You didn't tell us. Cause we it's, it's on the agenda, sir. The agenda was published weeks ago. Well, I thought it was a mistake. I, uh, so, sorry, because I was under the impression that that's standard protocol as well. As our, because we've never done that before in the past, so it would be easy to assume that that would be a mistake. It's not a mistake. It's the way that most boards and bureaus manage their meetings. But it's never it, been done there, never. We always have We're out of order. We're proceeding with the agenda as it was published weeks ago. We all know the meeting is in 15 minutes. Thank you. Good morning. Um, Dr. Aguilar Gaxiola, the slide presentation is up if you would like to begin. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Jonathan. I appreciate it. Uh, uh, and I want to thank, uh, we would like to thank uh, the, the board for this opportunity to talk about uh, uh, the title that, uh, that you see on the screen, Overcoming Health Inequities in LGBTQ Communities and then to draw some implications for continued medical education. I'm delighted to co-present with uh, Jonathan Cook uh, in, this, uh, in this meeting. Next. Just very briefly, uh, uh, to, uh, to be on the same page, uh, just to tell you a little bit about what uh, is health equity, a widely uh, accepted definition of health equity coming from Healthy People 2030. And it defines it in a simple way but profound uh, manner, uh, which is the attainment of the highest level of health for all uh, people. And then uh, it, it's important to have a sense of why uh, does it matter to talk about health equity or to health inequ inequities? Well, because everyone deserves a fair chance to lead a healthy life. And no one should be denied this chance because of who they are or their social economic opportunities. And a key question is, how do we, how do we work to advance health equity? Well, we, in order to do that, we must eliminate the avoidable health inequities and health disparities. And this requires short and long-term actions. Uh, next. Uh, just to, to uh, because we're going to be focusing on the LGBTQ uh, community, uh, I want to share a couple of slides on health disparities here, uh, uh, disparities uh, first. And as you can see on the screen, uh, uh, there is uh, some uh, uh, data that uh, uh, highlights the remarkable disparities or inequities that the LGBTQ uh, community uh, has been facing for years. Uh, for example, LGBTQ youth uh, are two to three times more likely to attempt suicide and or also more likely to be homeless. Uh, LGBTQ also have highest rates uh, of use for tobacco, alcohol, and drugs. And uh, in the case of bise uh, gay and bisexual men, trans women are at higher risk of HIV, STIs, especially among communities of colors. Lesbians are less likely to get preventive services for cancer. Uh, and, and, you know, transgender uh, uh, people at, are at greater risk uh, for suicide attempts, risks that are, we know that are mitigated by social support. 
Next. This slide is specifically on healthcare disparities. The previous one was on disparities general, in general, but this is healthcare. So, in the, in, and this is focusing more on transgender people. Uh, they are, uh, were refused uh, care, uh, verbally harassing medical settings, physically attacking doctor's office, thought uh, a, a postponed or avoided medical treatment and delay or did not try to get preventive health care in the percentages that uh, you can see on the screen. But also, uh, 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 half of them thought their medical providers uh, about transgender care. Uh, 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 and, and this is an important uh, piece to, to, to keep in mind. Uh, next, <clears throat> now I want to uh, briefly share with you a very recent survey, a nationwide survey that uh, was done by the Kaiser Family Foundation and CNN. It's called the Mental Health uh, in American Survey. Uh, very well done survey. I'm a researcher, and, and uh, it, it is uh, it's using solid methodology. Uh, next. So what I'm going to be presenting is uh, just some findings uh, coming from this uh, national survey on mental health. And uh, the arrow that you see on your left-hand side of the slide uh, uh, shows that uh, uh, about a third of adults under 30 uh, des uh, uh, describe their mental health as only fair or poor. And this is even a little bit, uh, 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 you know, higher uh, uh, in the LGBT uh, uh, adults. Uh, next. This is, a, uh, overall, the finding is that uh, 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 adults, including about half of those under 30, say they always or, or, or often felt anxious in the past 12 months. In the case of LG, LGBT uh, adults, this amount is, surpasses any other group, including the various age groups. 60% of, the, of, the, uh, of uh, the LGBT adults uh, mentioned that they always or often are uh, felt anxious in the past uh, 12 months. Next. It, 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 this is also very revealing because over 51%, over 50 percent of uh, uh, LGBTQ adults say in the past year that they did not get mental health services they thought they needed. So on the one hand, they are very uh, uh, impacted, you know, with uh, stress and uh, issues related to uh, mental health challenges like anxiety, but they are not getting the treatment that they are needing. Next. Uh, this is very, very revealing, actually. It's, uh, it's important to keep in mind that uh, uh, basically 61% uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, LGBT uh, adults uh, consider that uh, if they were to call uh, 911 uh, that uh, 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 they, they felt that uh, it wouldn't have an impact on them, or even worse, uh, they would be hurt. Uh, Forty-three percent, surpassing any other group that they thought that they, 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 would, uh, uh, they would be hurt. Uh, next. This gives, gives me hope, actually. This is about the newly introduced, uh, that was introduced in July of this year, the 988, which is a, a line specifically, specifically for suicide, that the new 988 mental health hotline uh, is, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 they, they know, uh, LGBTQ adults, they know about it more than any other group. Next. So with this in mind uh, of uh, the challenges, the multiple challenges that the LGBTQ populations have, I, I would like to share, uh, along with uh, Jonathan, a, 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 a project that Jonathan and I and others uh, embark on, and, and, uh, and, and that response to this question that has been uh, for me and the center that, that I direct of critical importance, that it, uh, it, it, is it possible to advance health or mental health equity in LGBTQ 
populations. So we're going to be chairing next. We're going to be chairing uh, the work that we did in Solano County, uh, and that they, 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 the partners themselves decided to call it interdisciplinary collaboration and cultural transformation model. Uh, this was a five and a, a, a half a, a, a year uh, project, uh, a, a, you know, with funding uh, from the Mental Health Services Act innovation uh, component. Uh, it focused uh, in three historically underserved populations in Solano County, and those are LGBTQ, uh, Latinos, and Filipinos. And it was anchored in the nationally recognized cultural linguistic the appropriate services standards, the, the class standards. Next. Our key partners, uh, you, you see them on the, on, on the slide, uh, 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 were the Solano Pride Center that Jonathan uh, Cook is the executive director of. But also, uh, uh, we work with Fighting Back, which is based in uh, Vallejo, uh, in the Vista Care uh, for uh, focus on Latinos, uh, 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 based in uh, a small town in, in Solano County, in Rio Vista. And this is a collaboration between the, uh, the Solano County Behavioral Health Division and our Center for Reducing Health Disparities. Next, very briefly, uh, our uh, primary goal was to improve mental health primarily in these three populations. And uh, so uh, uh, we, we have uh, goals on uh, community with uh, on the communities of focus in terms of uh, 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 strengthening uh, partnerships uh, with the county and among themselves uh, to increase awareness on mental health services, reduce stigma. We use the quadruple aim also uh, framework to get, guide our efforts, and this was geared towards uh, increasing access and utilization of services and also increasing the delivery, delivery of class services. Next. This is uh, what we basically did. You know, it's a project uh, with three different phases. The first phase, as you can see on this uh, wheel, uh, is about uh, doing a comprehensive cultural needs assessment. This took us uh, over a year and a half to do it through uh, key informant interviews, uh, focus groups, uh, community forums, and uh, we created some, uh, based on what we heard, uh, we, we had uh, community narratives that we used for the second phase, which was uh, a, the intervention, basically, and it was to, to do trainings uh, for, to three cohorts uh, uh, who, in turn, developed quality improvement uh, uh, action plans. And then the third phase, was the implementation uh, of these plans and the evaluation of the plans uh, uh, as well. And with this, uh, 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 Jonathan, uh, 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 goes back to you uh, to, to share with, the, with uh, the board what is it that we learned. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gaxiola. Uh, so for myself as director of Solana Pride Center, one of the three CBOs for this project, uh, working with the LGBTQ community was a component that we were tasked with. And uh, we really made sure that we wanted to focus on an intersectional approach uh, across Solano County, including working with the Filipino community and the Latino community and the intersection of uh, sexual orientation and gender identity as well and mental health outcomes. And as we, as we saw in this project, there was a, uh, a large amount of stigma reduction focus and uh, a focus on access to preventative services and trying to lower the amount of folks entering into crisis services for mental health crisis. And with our partners for the uh, Latino community and Filipino community, uh, Fighting Back Partnership in Vallejo, Rio Vista Care and Rio Vista for the Latino community, uh, we also developed a uh, cross uh, project uh, focus, which also was focusing on intersections for queer, transgender people of color within the county. And that was a project that each of the three uh, project coordinators for the three CBOs worked on collaboratively. Uh, some of the barriers that we identified were the uh, limited visibility for LGBTQ people in Solano County. 
Solano Pride Center represents the only LGBTQ center in the county and uh, does provide a majority of services, including mental health and uh, certain health care services for uh, residents of Solano County. Outside of that, there is a real lack of uh, LGBTQ welcoming spaces that do uh, exist outside of the center. When we began this project in 2016, the, uh, the reason that the LGBT community was identified as not accessing mental health services in the county was because uh, they weren't collecting any data on uh, sexual orientation and gender identity. And so that is the primary reason that they were selected as one of the groups to focus on. And so through this project, we've really been able to provide a lot of training to both the county and CBOs and community partners that we work with to be able to work on this. And that's something that's been implemented as a part of this project. And then also we, we focused on working with uh, faith communities, bringing them in as partners because that can be a historic uh, piece of trauma for many LGBTQ folks from uh, spaces that are not particularly welcoming and uh, identified gaps in service for the county with mental health in these three groups. Uh, so uh, across the three uh, CBO groups, uh, there was you know, a focus on immigration, uh, people experiencing homelessness, including youth, and then also uh, stigma and isolation that many folks experience that impacts their mental health. And another important piece of this project that Dr. Aguilar Gaxiola mentioned is the class standards, making sure that we focus and prioritize culturally and linguistically appropriate standards for care and focusing for those groups and making sure that we focus on uh, materials in English, but also in Spanish and Tagalog, which are the second and third most spoken languages in Solano County. And of course, within the LGBT community, Often transgender and non-binary people are at the highest uh, risk in most of these uh, different disparities that are experienced uh, by being part of this community. And so that was something that we wanted to do was really focus on educating providers and making sure that there was existing support. So as I mentioned, uh, people experiencing homelessness obviously impacts their mental health. And LGBTQ people are disproportionately impacted by homelessness. Uh, in particular, LGBTQ youth uh, represent almost 40% of homeless youth across California, which is an alarming statistic. And so if we're able to focus on those supportive and protective factors by working with schools, working with families, parents, to make sure that those uh, systems of support exist, we can really reduce that, as well as reducing crisis and mental health and uh, preventing folks going into crisis care through prevention. And as part of the focus groups in this project, we did do key informant interviews where we were able, able to uh, get uh, quotes that were really impactful. Uh, I think the one at the bottom there is in particular for me where this person is talking about the intersections of identity and the additional challenges that that can present. So this person uh, stated that communities of color and LGBT communities have the same difficulties as other mental health patients in addition to all of the problems and issues faced by communities of color in every other way. So some of the strengths and assets that were mentioned uh, throughout this project by our uh, community partners as well as our staff were that there was a big focus on advocacy, uh, working collaboratively with county and educational agencies to uh, do the educational component of this project, and to also provide training for providers, advocates, and patients. Uh, it was a very diverse project, of course, with the focus on ethnicity, race, and uh, sexual orientation and gender identity. And so diversity was often seen as a strength of this project. We also received feedback from providers where they said, uh, they had not particularly been involved in the class standards training, but that they were uh, happy to be able to participate in that as well as the uh, QI action plan improvements that we focused on with the county. And so the three CBOs as part of this project focused on uh, several QI action plans. We ended up with 14 in total. And these QI action plans were community focused, defined by the three CBOs, 
They worked in uh, collaboration with the county and UC Davis Center for Reducing Health Disparities. And there was a large training component of, this, uh, of these action plans. One of them which was important was making sure that we were focusing on <clears throat> kind of reducing those silos that exist across the care continuum in the county. And so the project coordinators focused on developing a true care map which was a uh, graphic that received input from stakeholders as well as the project coordinators about uh, where folks are able to access services and to be able to provide that and market that across the county. Uh, we also focused on an LGBTQ ethnic visibility campaign focusing on communities of color. And uh, we also focused on implementing the class standards. That's something that Solano County through the Behavioral Health Division actually adopted and made a requirement for uh, new contractors with the county. And uh, ensuring that folks are able to use Language Link, which is a resource available, so if someone does not speak English as their primary language, they're able to receive mental health care and translation and interpretive services. And with Solana Pride Center in particular, uh, which I have the privilege to be the director of, uh, we did focus on a partnership with Solano Community College, which is our local uh, community college, and focused on working with their Gay Straight Alliance, being able to work with interns. They do have a pipeline uh, that the um, county and the Behavioral Health Division focuses on to try to get folks into uh, programs to go into social work, marriage and family therapy, uh, psychology, and other mental health fields. And we also focused on the faith groups. Uh, Adrian Asben, our project coordinator at the time, uh, put together a collaborative working with faith groups across Solano County who met quarterly, uh, making sure that we were able to increase dialogue uh, between uh, clergy and uh, faith leaders as well as LGBTQ community members. And uh, there was a really strong sense of uh, pride at the collaboration that came out of that from both the faith leaders as well as community members. And uh, for focusing on LGBTQ youth, one of the things we did was <clears throat> work with this collaborative model to put together our first welcoming school summit, <clears throat> which put together providers as well as our uh, program participants and community members. And so focusing on one of the projects that Solano County Behavioral Health had on placing wellness centers in uh, most of the school districts throughout the county so that there is that ability to really focus on preventative mental health care and preventing uh, folks from going into crisis earlier on. There was also a identified need for creating uh, support for LGBTQ seniors in particular. Uh, the generation that threw the first brick at Stonewall is often going into uh, care nursing facilities and they are likely to have lost their partner to AIDS or they often do not have children, so they're often living in isolation. So in particular, there was uh, feedback that a lot of these folks don't feel comfortable being out. And so it's a common thing that they're going back into the closet when they go into these uh, care facilities. And so working with uh, training for these medical providers to really uh, increase awareness. Uh, and then with the program, we do uh, senior luncheons where we bring folks together in person and uh, do wellness check-ins with our case manager and social workers, and uh, making sure that we're really focusing on reducing that isolation, and also a, a component of stigma reduction for access to uh, mental health care, which is often, uh, we see a lot of resistance among seniors. And some of the lessons learned was that the LGBTQ community is really resilient as a result of that. As I mentioned, the <coughs> QI action plan that was across the three CBOs was focusing on queer trans people of color. This was something that was done in uh, partnership with each of the three CBOs to really ensure that there was an intersectional approach to the work that we did throughout Solano County. And this was uh, part of a su successful group that uh, has been sustainable and has continued since the project uh, completed. And then as one of the QI action plans for LGBTQ ethnic visibility as part of that intersectional approach, uh, these uh, came together as a result of feedback from focus groups from each of the subpopulations, uh, which was uh, really informative. Uh, so they are language specific, they are 
um, ethnically specific as well as LGBTQ, which was uh, the result of a lot of creative work. And the feedback in particular was to reduce stigma and to really uh, trigger some of those uh, important cultural values and um, identifiers. For example, the uh, flyer with the, uh, the Latino gay couple, they really mentioned in particular that they wanted to have a, a grandma there watching them cook. And that was something that we incorporated into the graphic, as well as the, uh, the graphic that we created for the Filipino community. Uh, bakla is kind of a loose translation for um, gay, which was historically a pejorative, but it's been reclaimed by many in the Filipino community. And so the message on that flyer was bakla is love, gay is love. And uh, Dr. Aguilar Gaxiola and I also mentioned the, uh, the uh, increased uh, access was a goal of the project. And so as you can see with each of the three subpopulations, there was a significant increase in calls for the intake line at the county. Um, in particular for the LGBT community, as you can see on the right hand of the slide, there was a 309% increase in calls to the access line from the beginning of this project to the end of the beginning of last year. Uh, and so we're making sure that we are really focused on that preventative care and uh, that's really encouraging data to see. Uh, and also there was a uh, decrease in admission to crisis services, 15% for the Filipino community, 8% for Latinos, and 8% for LGBTQ people as well. And so really focusing on uh, lowering folks going into crisis and increasing folks uh, in outpatient services. And the main takeaway from this was that by working collaboratively across the community that we increased trust. There's often a distrust of mental health services in general, as well as receiving services from government agencies. And so that had a overall um, benefit for uh, bolstering and fostering a sense of trust in public health. And uh, Dr. Aguilar Gaxiola, this is uh, back to you. Thank you so much, uh, Jonathan. Uh, Please, uh, the slide on, on uh, uh, the question on is it possible to advance mental health equity, which is the one that we posed at the beginning, and the answer to that is a resounding yes. Mental health equity can be advanced, as we documented, working very closely with uh, Solano Pride uh, Center and with Jonathan and other uh, 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 executive directors of other uh, CBOs. Next. This is a very powerful uh, YouTube a video that I strongly recommend if you haven't seen it, to see it. Uh, the title is To Treat Me, You Need to Know Who I Am. Uh, 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 you know, uh, there is no time uh, to show the video, but I strongly recommend uh, 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 because it's, uh, it's, a, it's very powerful. Next, there are only two more slides. These are some of the implications that we came up with uh, for uh, CME. Uh, first, understanding the health disparities that LGBTQ community experiences will help determine where, they are where there are gaps in care and how to overcome them. Uh, another one is that better education and training of healthcare professionals will include uh, LGBTQ-related health topics particularly in healthcare disparities as uh, uh, we, uh, we provided some data. Also, medical systems and physician providers need to be more proactive in ensuring that everyone has access to safe, equitable healthcare, particularly do, during the epidemic. And then, just to link it to the uh, video that I mentioned to you and what we learned in Solano County, is to get to know who LGBTQ individuals and communities are uh, and create a safe and nurturing space. Next, <clears throat> this last uh, slide is just to tell you how the uh, Association of American Medical Colleges uh, that I'm sure all of you know about, that they had paid a lot of attention on implementing curricular and, uh, and, 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 and institutional uh, climate changes this is with the intention to improve healthcare for individuals who are LGBT, uh, uh, gender nonconforming, uh, or born with uh, 
uh, uh, with uh, some some of the uh, uh, situations that uh, uh, LGBTQ population are uh, living with. Uh, so with this, uh, we are going to stop. And, and thank you again very much for this opportunity to share with you not only some uh, some of the very important uh, uh, pieces related to inequities experiencing but this important population, but also that it is possible to advance health equity uh, with them. Thank you, Dr. Aguilar Gaxiola, and thank you, Mr. Cook. Um, what an incredibly informative presentation. I also just want to thank Ms. Lubiano for um, requesting this and, and pushing us to put this on our agenda. We really appreciate that as well. Are there any questions or comments from board members? Uh, okay, Dr. Thorpe, uh, we'll take you first. Um, thank you very much. I agree. This is a very informative and uh, an important conversation to have. And as the medical board, I, I just wondered, um, in, in uh, Napa, Solano, or I realize this is Solano County, um, have, well, there's a couple of questions. One of them is, um, have you reached out to the local medical society uh, in Napa, Solano? Is there any uh, ability to connect with the local medical society, number one? And then I guess just the, the other, the, you know, there are, there are uh, physicians who are not members of the, of the medical society. Um, that's one of the advan well, anyway, there, there are other members. Um, is there any, any, um, outreach to, to them to try to, ed because it's an educational process and, and certainly we as the medical board want to educate our, our, our licensees about the importance of this. Yeah, uh, yes, thank you for the question. Um, the, the simple answer is yes, we, we have worked with the Napa Solano Medical Society and uh, they've been great partners as well as working with UC Davis with their Center for Reducing Health Disparities as well as the medical school. And locally in Solano County, we also have a medical college at Toro University as well. And so uh, we have worked with those educational partners. It's been a beneficial uh, partnership. Uh, but there is a lot of training that needs to be done just across the board um, for folks who are interacting with healthcare across all of the different disciplines. Um, so the, the need, is, uh, need is there and continues to need that support. And, and, and if I can just uh, compliment uh, uh, Jonathan, and, and thank you for the excellent question. Uh, we, we are very much involved in wide dissemination <clears throat> of the ICCTN model. Actually, uh, we were uh, really, we are very proud that we got uh, a second prize uh, from the, uh, Ameri uh, the Association of um, American Medical Colleges for uh, an award. Uh, about uh, community innovations and community engagement uh, for this particular project. And currently, we are also uh, in the middle of uh, a learning collaborative with over 40 counties, and we are training them. Uh, uh, you know, this is a, a full year training uh, for two cohorts of county representatives uh, uh, to, to train them uh, precisely on this uh, on this model, but uh, what you are mentioning is a is a wonderful question, and we ought to be doing much more to reach out to medical societies. Well, just to follow up, and that is, uh, would you be willing to give presentations at that you know, not only to that county medical society, but maybe to a broader population across the state? Because this is a obviously a statewide problem; it's not just local. Uh, certainly, that would be a Absolutely. tremendous opportunity. <laughs> well, go, go ahead, Jonathan. Oh no, I, I was I was done. Go ahead. Yeah, yes, the answer is yes. <laughs> we'll be happy to. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hawkins. Yeah, thank you very much. It's a mouthful. So, um, as I talk to my medical students, um, the topic comes up often, but I'm not sure how much that is related to just the culture and their age, how much is related to the curriculum. So, can you tell us a little bit about as your last hour's AMC, can you talk about how much this is being integrated into medical school curriculum and residency training program curriculum? We might imagine that it may come up in certain specialty peds or OBGYN, but it's probably across the board. So I'm asking about medical school curricula and residency training curricula. I would defer to uh, Dr. Aguilar-Gaxilla. <laughs> Thank you, Jonathan. 
Well, uh, an excellent question as well. And what I can tell you is that it's very much embedded in the, in the curriculum. Certainly at UC Davis uh, it is, but uh, <clears throat> the, the last slide that I presented uh, or that we presented is, uh, is a, a specifically uh, a resource for medical educators to uh, raise awareness uh, to the medical students and, and residents as well. This extends to residents and, 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 and to fac faculty of medical schools uh, to really put this uh, important uh, 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 emphasis uh, in the water of uh, the education that is being made. It, is, uh, it has been taking hold for years now, um, and I'm very pleased to, 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 to share that with you. You know, sometimes um, um, the subject is raised and the importance is raised and individuals in the community, the medical school, whatever, resident training parent will adopt it. But often, uh, if there's a box you have to check, then it's more likely to become uh, part of the culture of the institution. Uh, do you know if that exists? I'm not aware of that. Sp Specifically, but yeah, Dr. Gexilla. Oh, oh, okay. <clears throat> yes, it, it does. It does. Uh, I can I can speak spe specifically about what's happening in UC Davis. Uh, the, this has for years been a part of the uh, co uh, institutional culture. Uh, it is very much uh, supported, but by, by our top uh, leaders, and not only with UC Davis. I'm I'm aware that this is being done, for example, with uh, the UC uh, system, uh, system-wide, you know, the, uh, the uh, 10 campuses and specifically the five uh, 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 academic health centers, you know, uh, 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 out of the UC system as well. And uh, in UC Davis, we are very proud, uh, proud to have gotten uh, national recognitions uh, for focusing on LGBTQ uh, care uh, or focus on, on LGBTQ, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 sensitive uh, uh, care uh, as well. So uh, speaking, uh, speaking from the institution that I'm affiliated with, uh, absolutely, there, is a, uh, there has been a, an institutional culture that uh, focuses on the importance of paying attention uh, uh, to the needs of uh, uh, LGBTQ and also to create uh, uh, safe spaces uh, and equitable uh, uh, care uh, for them as well. That transpires uh, with medical students, residents, and, and, and faculty as well. Thank you very much. Additional uh, questions, uh, Dr. Bolat, and then I see you, Dr. Mahmoud, next. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, what an extremely excellent presentation. And just a couple of questions. Um, as we look at the um, issue of fellowships, and there's a few campuses that have the LGBTQ fellowships, and my concern is, is that, and I love the fact that we actually have one, but you know, this has to be generalized, right? You, you aren't going to build enough fellowships in LGBTQ, but some myth busters. So one of the ones that I would like to ask is, gee, in the rural communities, we don't have a gay and lesbian problem. Uh, that's really only in urban, uh, urban America. I would love to know the stats on that. That's important. I'm concerned about our agricultural workers, that uh, many of them, and I've worked with some of them, that have tried to escape uh, from the uh, humiliation that they face in their home countries, in their home country. And then finally, to Dr. Hawkins' point, and that is the uh, AAMC and the, I think, I'm not sure if this is what he was alluding to, but often the curriculum, uh, particularly I'm interested in GME, graduate medical education, because I think there's a big change in the medical student to the physician going into his or her specialty. Um, that is the opportunity to train and teach, and that curriculum often, there is, you know, there's so many things that doctors are tasked or program directors are doing. It's 
putting this under the EDI flag that I think is really important, and I'm going to review that AAMC document, but I think there's a challenge of trying to get this generalized, and I think it's a great start, and I'd love to hear a little bit uh, to how you might do that, and if you're using the P flags, and secondly, at Stanford, you're probably aware of their Elcove project, and that's really creating a safe space for youth, although the age range is from 12 to 25. Mm -hmm. I think those are interesting things. My concern is that these go into very nice suburban areas, and you don't have them in a CBO where you're working. So just a lot of questions, but just wanted to get my idea out there and just to hear your responses. Yeah, um, thank you for the question, that was excellent. And uh, Solano County is really a mixture, right? Where we're halfway between Sacramento and San Francisco, very suburban, but we also do have the agricultural component. We're part of wine country. Um, and so there is a really, you know, a diversity of needs that exist and, and that, that climate that exists around awareness, understanding, acceptance of LGBTQ people um, is definitely challenging in certain pockets of our county. Uh, we have an Air Force base in Fairfield as well, Travis Air Force Base. Um, I would say that we've made significant progress around that and the training component. Um, just speaking for Solano Pride Center for our clinical program, we do receive uh, referrals from uh, the gender clinic at UCSF as well as UC Davis uh, because we are really the only resource in between those two metro areas. Um, so it's, it's a challenge for many of these rural communities and thank you for raising that point. Dr. And, and if I okay. if I can sure. complement uh, Jonathan's uh, answer, uh, uh, to an excellent excellent observation, an excellent comment. Uh, I uh, working with rural populations and uh, out of our center, we have uh, at least four projects uh, uh, focused on on uh, uh, farm worker uh, populations. I can tell you that, uh, and I, I can validate, or I can, uh, you know, say that uh, the, your observation uh, with that specific uh, uh, population, uh, it, it, it resonates with me based on what we have learned uh, working with them. Uh, but uh, we have a ways to go uh, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, training uh, and uh, I, I and we are doing some of that actually out of our center because we cons consistently have medical students. And uh, this afternoon, I'm going to uh, give a talk uh, to the post-baccalaureate uh, students that many of them are going to go into medical school. And uh, we have given talks uh, uh, about the importance of focusing on historically underserved populations, including farm workers, by the way. Uh, but... Uh, uh, I, I, I still consider that uh, really we need to be much more sensitive for these vulnerable populations uh, to, to learn directly from them the needs that they have and to come up with uh, safe ways to, uh, to address them. Thank you, Dr. Malou. Thank you, Ms. Larson. Thank you. This is really a very important and uh, one of the probably most important issues in medical field in California, actually all over the country, actually all over the world. Um, uh, there cannot be anything more compelling and urgent than this. And I'm so, so proud of the medical board bringing this up in the beginning and uh, discussing this. Um, what I believe is that uh, there are three different ways. Number one is to change the provider culture. Number two, to teach and train residents and fellows and people who are coming. That is a long process. It might not show results 10, 15 years, but we're, what we're doing now is change the culture. There is a huge hesitation, resistance. There is a fear of LGBTQ plus community to go to a doctor. And we are talking about in California, and I'm talking about even Southern California, which is probably the most liberal and broad-minded community in the world. And we really cannot be just waiting, okay, making this project for years and years. I think there should be a really an urgent and immediate, some pilot project, something. We need to change the culture that not a single LGBTQ plus member has any fear, any hesitance, any resistance of going and independently talking
talking to the providers. It's not only providers like medical doctors or DOs, it is about all the allied healthcare, the physical therapy, the nurses. The, there is really huge, because I'm a practicing doctor and I know some other people are. We, what we see is really society is still very bigoted and there needs to be a lot more done. And on top of that, teaching the medical community, I think there should be a stronger and broader program to teach and uh, make public aware. Because this is in a certain set of people probably 2% or 3% of the population who are in medical field, but this is a 98% general population and still is not accepting a lot of them. Although we have made progress, the progress made is not really good. I would really strongly recommend to bring you guys on and on and any pilot project, anything you want to do, I am here. I will participate fully wherever you need in Southern California. I'll be able to help in any county because there are still counties here which are really living in Stone Age. And we need to change this now, sooner, before we lose too many people, emotionally, physically, and some people lose life because they cannot get access. So thank you for doing this thing, but honestly, this is an urgent, urgent emergency which we need to address now. Thank you, additional comments? Uh, Mr. Walken. Can, can, I, can I just say uh, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Mahmoud, for uh, your 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 comment, uh, I totally agree with uh, all all you said, and uh, I'm actually inspired by by your words. Thank you, Mr. Watkins, thank and you. then we'll go to Ms. Lubiano next. Well, thank you very much. That was very insightful. I didn't catch the first five minutes, but um, Mr. Cook, uh, you work in one of these centers that deal directly with the LGBT plus community and so you are pretty familiar with the prejudice that guides that the actions of the people in that space they speak about it they are communicating their pain and their anguish because of it do you have some insight you know for any of us that want to you know address some of our own you know unconscious prejudices towards the LGBTQ plus community about how we can become more aware and sensitive to that community? Uh, thank you for the question. I, I think it's timely. There are, there are excellent resources for continuing medical education that I think are uh, really great opportunities for providers, um, as well as also getting to know your local LGBTQ centers and health providers. Um, I have to give a shout out to the LA LGBT Center, which is the largest uh, center in the world. They do a ton of healthcare, including dental, um, vaccine clinics, um, but also just catching up with the innovations that exist in uh, treatment for LGBTQ people and conditions that impact them disproportionately. Um, in particular, uh, around HIV care and HIV prevention, um, a lot of providers are unfamiliar with where we are in those treatments. Um, as well as gender affirming care, that's really a big need for our trans and non-binary community, and <clears throat> a lot of a lot of youth and parents and uh, educators are really coming to us and asking, you know, we don't know where to connect these folks to in terms of the care, uh, because there's a component where they need to be linked with a clinician and also with a doctor who knows what they need to do to uh, help these patients. And so I think um, a big training component is is a is a good way to get started. Thank you, Ms. Lubiano. Thank you for this conversation. And as, as you had mentioned, Mr. Cook, how looking at some of these disparities, it's alarming. And it calls for our attention and, and need to change on different levels. Um, and so I was wondering, looking at the second slide that summarized some of the disparities there are between LGBTQ plus communities and, and you know, straight communities. I, I'm imagining there's probably even more disparities when you break that down you know, against BIPOC communities. Mm -hmm. And um, I was wondering, do you have that data? And I imagine it's much more alarming. Yes, uh, thank you for mentioning that. That was, that was one of the reasons that the three CBO uh, project coordinators focused on that joint action plan to focus on 
uh, raising awareness and support for queer and trans people of color because it's true that there are they're at the highest um, uh, rates for these disparities among LGBTQ folks for uh, new HIV infections, uh, for experiencing homelessness, mental health uh, conditions, uh, and violence against LGBTQ people, um, particularly impacts uh, trans women of color. And so, you know, we really need to make sure that we have a approach that is going to really have a targeted intervention and prevention focus for those communities in particular. Thank you. Thank you. Additional comments or questions from board members before we open it up to the public? All right, seeing none. Um, Janelle, if I could have the, do we have any additional speaker slips for this item? Okay, great. Um, and I'm not clear uh, whether the agenda item 16, whether um, you all wish to speak on this particular item, but uh, Mr. Andrist, uh, Ms. Uh, Connect. Okay, or Ms. Hollingsworth, you noted 16. Okay, um, uh, anyone else uh, here in the hearing room with us who'd like to make a public comment? Okay, we'll go to the uh, phone. Looks like we have one commenter on the phone. Yes, first up, we have Stacia Kleber. Go ahead, please. Your line is open. Oh, I'm online to speak to the next issue. Okay, thank you. Okay, and no one else on the line? Nope. Great, thank you. We'll bring it back to um, the board. And I just want to thank you, uh, Mr. Cook, again, and Dr. Aguilar Gaxiola uh, for joining us today for pre presenting this incredibly uh, important topic to us. and. I guess really um, peaking, you know, uh, or, or sparking interest in all of us about wh how we can all um, collectively do more. So we look forward to partnering with you all in the future. Are there any final comments before we move on to the next agenda item? All right, thank you again, Mr. We Cook, for being one, here. Thank person. you. One more thank public you. comment if you're available. I'm sorry, what? I apologize, there is one more public comment if you would like to take it. Okay, on agenda item 16. Do we have a public comment? Yes, Virginia okay, sorry, Fowler, your line is open. Please go ahead. Hello. Thank you for presenting this. It is great information. I think it needs to be used worldwide. I think it was well done. And it addresses a significant impact. Um, right now, I'm in a severe trauma response because I can say me too to every single thing due to my trauma, due to medical errors. And there's no awareness, no testing, no education, no study, no research. I am terrified to go to the doctor today and this being first not trauma informed and having a silence prior to this and then hearing this and not having the resources that prevented, that is presented here I am not sure that I can go to the doctor today because of all my trauma. And you is constantly ignored that this population is similar to all the other marginalized populations, but nothing like this is brought to the medical board to help us who is directly affected by medical errors. And I really wish this Research will be done on this for those affected by medical errors and to shut us, to silence us before this presentation was not trauma informed. It was trauma inducing. It should have said, you can speak this time and be aware this next speech will be traumatizing to you because you don't have the resources presented here. There's no awareness of it. You guys were terrified to go to the doctor and there's nobody supporting you. And brought a trauma informed safe container around this information. Instead, we were silenced before it for the first time ever I've been to the medical board. But right now, my heart is racing, my legs are shaking, tears are coming down my eyes, and I have no clue how I'm going to make it to the doctor's appointment in the next couple hours. I have been terrified for the doctor for weeks because I don't have this resource that you just presented. 
sir. You need to do this for medical errors as well. Please, sir. Please address the medical error community because it's marginalized just like all these other communities. We're the most vulnerable population there is because nobody is advocating for us at all. We are invisibly injured and traumatized. So please, sir, put this in your study as well. Thank you. Thank you, for your, thank you for your public comment. Are there additional? It looks like we have two more commenters on the line. Yes, up next we have Susan Shinezi. Go ahead, please. Your line is open. Hello, this is Susan Shinezi. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm from Bakersfield and I volunteer with Consumer Watchdog and um, Hospital Watchdog. And I just, I want to let you know, I do fully support the Accountability Act because I received no accountability when I was injured. Um, this isn't related I, I to the agenda item. Ma'am, I believe injury. you, ma'am, if I could just stop you, I believe you want to speak on agenda item 17, which is next on our agenda. So if you could hold your comment until that time. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Thank you. No problem. We have the next commenter. I'll just confirm you wish to speak okay. on agenda item 16. Susan Lauren, go ahead, please. Your line is open. Hi, I wasn't going to comment, but when I heard Virginia, I just wanted to comment to let her know that I support her, and it really hurts my heart to hear that, and she always makes very good points. Um, it's just very, I mean, we want everyone to be supported. Um, I feel very bad for this. As far as the gender affirming situation, I commented last night and I'm very concerned about doctors removing healthy organs from people and doing other things that are going to cause long-term problems. And I think that um, in that community, um, there's a lot of vulnerable people that can be groomed by doctors. And it's, it's a problem, and I hope that that is also uh, an avenue that you study and look at. There's a lot of people be transitioning that um, are really messed up from, from just bad situations. But, you know, keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Uh, it looks like we have no more public comments on the line. So we're going to, again, thank you, Mr. Cook. Thank you, Dr. aguilar Gaxiola, for being with us today. Uh, we're going to move on to agenda item 17, which is discussion and possible action on the board's sunset report. Mr. Bone. Thank you. Good morning, Madam President and members. Before we get into the Sunset Report itself, I thought it would be helpful to discuss the process involved in Sunset Review, as some of the um, members today joined after the Board's previous Sunset Review. The process is called Sunset Review because the statutory authority to appoint Board, board members and the Executive Director cr uh, contain a sunset date. This is the date for that authority to expire. For this board, our next census date is January 1, 2024. The task before you today is to consider and approve your sunset report, which is the first key step in the process. To complete this report, staff were provided a lengthy questionnaire from the legislature, which required a significant amount of narrative writing and the production of a multitude of statistics about the board's licensing and enforcement programs, including certain administrative matters, such as the condition of the board's financial position. After this report is approved, staff will spend the month of December making any changes that the board directs today, complete a final review of the content before submitting it before uh, our deadline of January 3rd. Separately, we would expect that this report, uh, the first report from the enforcement monitor, will coincidentally be published around this time. Once we submit our sunset report, legislative staff will review the content as it will help to inform the topics that will be discussed at upcoming sunset hearings. 
The hearings for the board, for the various boards going through Sunset Review, typically are held between late February and late March. Although most boards have one hearing, this board had two multi-hour hearings during our Sunset Review in 2021. After sunset hearings, the board will provide responses in writing to various questions or topics posed by the legislature. After those responses are provided, then we would expect to see bill language emerge that will extend the sunset date of the board and include other statutory changes to the Medical Practice Act or other areas of law related to the board. Like other legislation, the board sunset bill will have hearings before the legislature throughout next year. The legislature will end their session in 2023 in mid-September and the governor's deadline to sign or veto bills is mid-October of 2023. At this point, I'd like to pause to see if the members have any questions about the sunset review process that I can answer. Mr. Bone, could you just, uh, I think I, I didn't hear you when you said when the enforcement monitors report was going to be available. Could you just re-mention that? Yeah, so as a part of uh, the board's previous sunset review in 2021, the legislature included a law to uh, appoint a sunset, excuse me, appoint an enforcement monitor who is charged with producing two reports, two public reports. The first one is due, I believe it's January 1, 2023, and the subsequent one, July of 2023. Great, thank you. Any other questions about the process? Uh, Dr. Thorpe? So the, the, our, our, first, our first deadline is January 1. January 3rd is the deadline 3rd, for, okay. for us to submit this report to the legislature. Any other questions about process before Mr. Bone gets into the rest of his report? Uh, Dr. Hawkins. Do you have a date? You may have said it, I may have missed it. When we actually go before the legislature, is it already been put on the calendar? It's, it's not been determined yet. Um, Typically, the range is between late February to late March, um, but, but this is a legislative process, and they are free to change that as they desire. So turning to the report itself, Madam President, members, uh, it's broken down into multiple sections that correspond to different topics of board operations, like financing and staff, licensing and enforcement. The committees with the primary oversight of the board pose specific questions to us that require a narrative response, a statistical response, or sometimes both. Most of the content in the draft report before you is merely fact-based, which is to say we are responding to questions that ask us to describe the board's practices, policies, and procedures on a variety of topics. The section of the report that gets typically the most amount of attention and interest is section 12. This is the place where the board has the opportunity to raise issues of note or concern to the legislature and to make specific requests. Most of the items in this section 12 uh, would be familiar to the board and has been discussed in previous meetings and have been priorities for the past two years or so. Other items uh, have been added following board action or discussion earlier this year. I'd like to highlight the new items in section 12 that have either not been previously discussed or were substantially modified since the prior board discussion. The previously requested fee amount of $1,150 for initial licensure and renewal for physicians and surgeons is no longer projected to be sufficient to cover the board's financial needs. Additional details of this are provided in section three of the report. But to summarize what it states, based upon current and future projected expenditures, including repayment of additional future anticipated loans, we project that a fee amount of $1,350 for those physician-related fees will be necessary. To address possible future expenses, we recommend that the legislature authorize the board to use the rulemaking process to further increase this amount by up to 10%. Next. Under current law, the board receives reports about licensees who are arrested or convicted of crimes in California, but a statutory change is necessary to receive such reports about licensees who are arrested or convicted of crimes outside of the state. Staff are working with the Department of Justice to develop language now and therefore have included language on this matter to notify the legislature that we wish to address this topic during Sunset Review next year. Next, as discussed yesterday, in our board meeting, the board has been facing very long application processing timeframes. This is largely due to a substantial increase in application volume due to a change in the law. To help ensure patient access to care by PTL holders 
who are transitioning to a physician and surgeon license, we've included language that would inform the legislature that we wish to explore statutory changes to allow a PTL to be issued for a longer period of time or to provide the board more authority to extend the expiration date of a PTL. Lastly, the final draft report before you for, excuse me, the final draft proposal for a complainant liaison unit is also included, which calls for the board's executive director to develop a stakeholder engagement process after development and establishment rather of this unit. Before I turn it back to the members for discussion, I would like to suggest that the board direct staff how they wish to prioritize our various requests in section 12. Two years ago, we bundled the various items into common themes, financial enforcement and licensing, and those three sections were reflective of the board's priorities at that time. The draft before you also bundles proposals by topic <clears throat> with the board's finances provided first, followed by enforcement, licensing, and administrative proposals. I, I think the staff would probably see the board's financial position as perhaps being the most urgent to, to address, but the rest of the proposals in the section are not necessarily reflective of the board's priority order, of the staff's priority order, excuse me. Um, this will require a motion and a vote to approve the sunset report. And when making a motion, Madam President, I'd suggest including direction for staff to work with the president and the vice president to incorporate into the report any changes approved today by the board to make any necessary minor non-substantive changes when we place this into its final format. And lastly, the final version will also include a cover letter from the president, which will be drafted after today's meeting. Thank you for your patience, and we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Bone. Um, so I think a motion seems premature at this time, so I'll take board comments or questions first. Uh, Mr. Watkins? I would like to know if this is the appropriate time for me to introduce the proposed legislative changes that I have submitted for the board's consideration. I, I, I think it's the appropriate time, and I think what you're referring to is the document that uh, we received about uh, I guess yesterday, right, from you, and that was yes. circulated to the board members? Yes. This is the appropriate time. This is the appropriate time. So the backdrop to that document is that when you sit on this board for as long as I have and not as long as many of the other board members and staff, then there's a recurring theme there's the recurring theme that, you know, we're just spinning our wheels, enforcement-wise. And so I took it upon myself because I couldn't live with myself anymore. And that is not over-dramatizing. And I decided to reach out to every patient advocate, every patient that was harmed, that called into this board, over the last, since I've been here. I have all the notes. I just wanted to confirm that the stories that I heard was indeed correct. And I had many ideas. That 14 page document that I provided to the board, even though it was last minute, was just very, it, 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 it's, a, it's, a, it's a drop in the ocean of what people really wanted. And I found to, I edited that document down to the most important components that would best protect the public from a purest point of view. And my goal today, and it's, it, it's, it, it's, it's, it's deeper than what I can explain to you. And I just need a minute. I want to ask my fellow board members today, in the most earnest way that I can, to adopt this Accountability Act, to be part of the Sunset Review. But I'm going to motivate why I'm asking. Up to the last few years, I found myself grateful, grateful to be on this board, even though I have criticized many of the issues on the board, I found myself like in a very emotional, grateful space. Because I realize that we have an extraordinary opportunity to make meaningful impacts on people's lives. We exist for one primary reason, 
one reason only, and that is to protect the public. Not to rehabilitate, not to consider the doctor's reputations and the economic interests, but to protect the public as our core. And we do this by assessing whether an accused doctor presents a potential risk to the public and how that risk can be mitigated, if indeed it can. So right now, right now as the board is, and today I've actually seen evidence of the very patterns that I've spoken about, a great injustice is taking place under our watch. Every one of us here, and there's a, you know, there's this deal, you can commit injustice by just being silent. We oversee an enforcement process that operates by legally excluding the complainant's input in that process. But more troubling than that is when that initial complainant's input is strategically used to discredit and undermine them before the board panels. And just for, as a side note, those board panels do not have a legal standard that it maintains to. Many of that uh, conversation that we are presented by the Attorney General's office, you could not put in a deposition. There's rules that guide that around the hearsay, around extraneous con uh, conversations. Many of those conversations will not be allowable in a hearing. And so that makes it a really interesting but unfair process for the complainant. Can you imagine right now an enforcement system where the complainant is consistently ignored? We all have seen it, discredited and undermined, kind of randomly. If this only happened a few times, I wouldn't be talking here. I wouldn't put myself at this risk. I wouldn't put myself through this mental torment. But it actually happens way more consistently than I would like to admit. Can you imagine a system where the experts in that system, and we spoke about it yesterday, are consistently prejudged to be unqualified, inexperienced, are undermined and made to look incompetent? Now again, reasonable, some of them may be, but you cannot do it all the time. That points to a pattern. Can you imagine even further that during, as an adjudicator on that, in that system, that you are only provided an interpretation, an interpretation of an investigation and, or, and an expert report without the ability to vet whether the interpretation is in fact correct or if it's just not made up. I want you to understand that that's my experience on the board. That's my lived experience. And the fact that we do not afford legal, legal rights for the complainants to be in the process is the root of what is happening. And the symptoms is what I've pointed to last year. I've pointed to a 1.4% probation period on 10,000 complaints. I pointed to half a percent revocation rate. I've pointed to 95% dismissal rate. I thought about bringing a visual impact of that into this room and I thought, no, nah, I don't want to over-dramatize it. I've beaten this doors to death. Everybody knows this. But what I say, evident more by yesterday's disclosures, when we, having a f when we had a great frank discussion, frankly, more frank than I've seen having on this board around the expert issues. And I was actually pleasantly surprised, and I tried to come into these meetings every time different. I do a lot of self-reflection, and I've seen that I've been aggressive in moments and I've been accused of not understanding, and I've been called various names, and that's okay, this is part of the process. But what I saw yesterday was the first stage of admitting 
that there's a problem here, a big problem. We are underfunded, which we will address in legislation, and I've got some ideas. We are understaffed, and we are undertrained. So, since our great responsibility uh, is to protect the public, and I want to, I, I want to just take a moment here to show you who that public is, who they are, sorry. That public is here. There's people in this room, Tracy Dominguez, who lost her daughter, Demi. She called in. We cared for a moment. Her grandson, Malachi, died as well. We cared for a moment. Tammy is here. She lost her son, Alex. We cared for a moment. Eric Andrews lost a sister. Marion Hollinsworth lost a uh, father. Eric Alka, she lost a sister. These are the people that I went to go listen to because I wanted to understand why do they do what they do because I'm more importantly, I wanted to understand why I am doing what I'm doing. And you know why I'm doing what I'm doing? Because I grew up in an oppressive country that marginalized people. And we are marginalizing the health consumers in California. In December 2022, these are the rules. And they're all oppressive. They are all oppressive. And I just want to ask my fellow board members, and the most earnestly, there's only one right way then every other way is a compromised way. And that compromised way, let that be at the feet of the legislature, not at our feet. And I wanna thank you for the time, Madam Chair. I wanna thank the people who came out that's in this audience that have truly lost something. I've lost nothing in this process. I am unafraid of what will happen to me during this process. And I've been shunned and I've been told certain things behind the scenes by people on the street that didn't like what I was doing. I don't care because the right thing has never changed for me. Thank you for your time and I urge you to just adopt this. Let's drop this on the legislator and drive this process too. And a final note, final note. <sighs> when I started this process, I decided I'm either all in or I stay at home and play with my friends' bulldogs and my wife. And I've talked to people in California and one of those people that I spoke to is the trial attorney, Nick Rowley, more famed because of his groundbreaking negotiations and changing micro. And in a conversation where I expressed this level of commitment, he told me, and more to tell you, let's do the right thing. If we can't do the right thing here, then I will commit with Mr. Rowley to take this, everything I've asked. I don't care if I run into CMA. I don't care who I run into. I'll take this, and he guaranteed that he will back me. He wants to back me and take this to a ballot measure. And we'll let California's health consumers decide whether we are doing the right thing. I would like that not to happen. The people on this board, I have huge amounts of respect, and I, I didn't always show that. And I wish that, you know, today, Ms. Castro would be here, uh, because she was really instrumental in me to, in, in my continuing, and moments I wanted to give up. But it was, she urged me to keep studying and that's what I did. 
And I just, again, finally, I've done my work. I've asked. Now it's all up to you to do your end. Join me in this epic struggle, which we know it is, to do the right thing. Those folks out there, the only reason why they're there is because they don't want this to happen to other people. And when I listen to the stories, read the cases, it's a repetition of a repetition. I respect all of you, and I just want to thank you for this opportunity. And now I can start sleeping again, because I've done my bit. Mr. Watkins, thank you for your comments, and um, thank you for the document that we uh, received, uh, as I mentioned at the outset, just a, a short while ago. Um, we welcome your input. We welcome uh, the perspectives of all of our colleagues, and I look forward to having a robust discussion um, today, not just about your proposal, but about any other ideas that um, other members have. With respect to your proposal specifically, a couple things I, I just... I just wanted to mention maybe questions for you because we did have, um, again, a robust conversation at our strategic planning um, discussion at, I think the meeting was in October, I'm, I, my memory's failing me, maybe it was in September, um, around many of the ideas that are in the proposal you shared with us, again, just a day ago. Um, the, the conversation we had there were around ideas about transparency, um, additional complaint and involvement, and what we had agreed to at that time, at least I, and what I understood we agreed to, is that we were going to spend, um, that we were going to prioritize that in our strategic plan, um, which I believe it's not final yet, but that we were going to prioritize having uh, really a robust evaluation and careful consideration of some of those ideas as part of that process. Um, and I think, again, I think we just all agreed to that in October. We did specifically uh, talk about Business and Professions Code um, uh, 2330 during that conversation. We, we, again, agreed to consider that as part of our strategic planning process and prioritize it for our staff in that way. Um, you know, one of the, the very real concerns I have is that presenting us with this, you know, 14 or plus document, I think I received it at 12.40 a.m. on, um, uh, Tuesday morning really doesn't give our staff who had already you know been in the process of traveling uh, or the board frankly enough time to thoughtfully consider all of the numerous proposals um, and so we can again I think we met in October we talked about how we were going to prioritize these things some of the ideas frankly are reflected already in the sunset report so whether it's complainant tracking complainant liaison unit um, I think there are certainly some refinements, but I think it would be helpful to all of us to think through how we can enhance what's in our sunset report and also allow sufficient time to develop some of the ideas which truly are new and require additional, I guess, thought. So I just want to respond to that because I was anticipating it. You know, one of my big concerns always at this board is that Nothing is said in good faith. And again, it, it, it troubles me. We, any, any one of you can go back to the strategic planning video and you can see me raising these issues. And then you can see me being directed by our board chair to come to this meeting and present this. That's what I've done. But since the rules change continually, and it does, we just saw it this morning, when, you, when we change the rules and we cannot stand with our word, then it starts feeling exactly like that marginalization process that is contained in all of the laws that I am suggesting that we change. I am not asking for you to go do deep dives. These things have been asked for 15, 20 years. Nothing on that document, nothing, not a single thing has not been mentioned at a board meeting throughout the years. And I've heard, I've watched every 
I've watched almost every meeting. I've watched every sunset review, and I know what the rebuttals are on each of those items. But here's my advice. I'm going to give a blanket answer to all of them. The results of those laws are in. They are already in. We've got the results. There's the statistics. There's the behaviors. And those laws do not serve the public. It's time to try something new. We do not have a choice but to try something new. Mr. Watkins, I, I just want to call to your attention that following the strategic planning session, I sent you an email asking to meet with you specifically for this purpose of understanding your proposals so that we could direct staff to f either evaluate them, come to this meeting prepared. You didn't afford me the courtesy of a response to that email. Since we have comments from the other members. Since we're talking about that, let me tell you why I don't respond. It's really hard to operate in an environment where you are continually gaslit, made to think that there's something wrong with you, made to think that you're out of line, make you to think and question your own sanity. I choose not to speak to this board because no conversation is in good faith. And if that, what we've seen here today, is not evidence of it, then I don't know. L like once again, I want to emphasize, I can only speak the truth. I am willing to meet with this board in a forum like this where we publicly discuss things and are held accountable to that public. Mr. Rockins, so, I'm not, uh, So, uh, I mean, I, I don't, I'm a busy person. I don't have time to waste my time. I'm here because I'm committed to the public, to the board, and I trust what is being communicated. Um, I think there are certain things we've made clear. We need more money. We're a sinking ship. We need to change how we engage with the public to meet them closer to where they need us to be within the laws. If it was easy, it would have been done by now. I, I mean, I, if it was easy, it would have been done by now. We have constraints, we have limitations. And I appreciate the fact that TJ is doing what he's doing. But at some point, we have to sit down and make a decision about what we're going to try to solve. And that involves us having a dialogue. I don't know what it means to say that the implication that you respect the board, but you can't trust what we're saying, TJ. I, I, I don't know how to interpret that. But, I don't, but I'd like for you, <laughs> if, it only if you could clarify in a way that you feel you have to, in a way that makes us work better, I'd like for you to do that. But I really think that we're going to blow a lot of time if we don't get some focus about what we're going to try to accomplish today. I'm let here to work. I'm let here me to work. Let me clarify that for, for Mr. Walken. Hawkins. Yeah. I have, a, I have all the emails from trying to do it one way from last year. All the emails, all the effort, all the meetings. And I still had to go to the media to get, your, to get the board's attention at the time. It wasn't something that I wanted to do. Was never, I, I'm not, I don't like public displays. I kind of just keep to myself. Solution here today is very simple. The solutions here are very simple. The 14 pain the 14-point plan that I outlined addresses the core issues that was presented by the public. I am just a vehicle to bring that, and I agree with every one of them. And there's more, but asking more is not an option. So today, there's only one choice. And that choice is, well, there's two choices. <laughs> you choose to support it, 
and we move forward and leave it at the legislature's door and fight like it's our lad's breath because that's what it's going to take. It's not going to be easy. None of this is ever going to be easy, cheap, or any of that. But we have the public then supporting us on that journey. Now they are standing up against the board like I am. That's not constructive. When we, yeah, we, we, we're not the enemy. We, and there's no enemy. There's just the legislature who has to make a decision. So you either vote yes, we adopt this, drop it at the legislature, or you say no, I'm not interested. Those are the options. I agree with your statement about the legislature. And I, I would say that I got the, your comments and I could only briefly peruse it because of the time constraints. You know, we did in panel A, we're busy and, and, and there's a lot of things we have to do. And I, and I just think that we need time to look at it, but there are some things that have been thoughtfully considered that probably um, are in your proposal. I just want us to move forward if we can. Yeah. Uh, can I, I'd like other Look, comments, yeah. please. Dr. Yeah. Mahmoud. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. Um, I got on this board with only one goal and one mission that was to protect Californians. And that's what I have done at every single moment. And I can solemnly say that every single word, everything I have done not against public interest. Um, I do admire and respect T.J. Warkin of his courage and his uh, advocacy for people. And I also agree that things should be very transparent and should be open, and people need to know wh whoever is sitting here what they're doing. But I have a one thing which I take as an offense or insult on your part, Mr. Watkin, that you put every physician, a biased, corrupt person who is there on the board saving physicians. In my practice of 23 years of medicine, I have never charged one patient who did not have insurance, and my office is open for anybody who do not have insurance. We give long dates to people who have insurance. I fight every single day to HMOs, IPAs, plans, to other doctors, to, I go out of my way to get people who are homeless to get them housing. And at this point, I, I and people like me are portrayed that we are just doing our vested interest over here. It is not that, it is not that every physician is like that. I have been on medical executive committees. I have been chief of staff of a hospital. I have been in a position to be on the board of the hospitals and have disciplined many physicians. I don't come here and sit on this table with any interest, zero interest, to save any physician of his wrongdoing. The whole and ultimate goal is to protect people. There might be decisions which many people don't agree. And any decision, even come from Supreme Court or anywhere else, some people don't agree and some people agree. It doesn't mean the person sitting there voting is just going against that. And removing physicians, how many other boards are there the specialties, the, those specialties are not there on the board, and you want to remove all the physicians from the board and make just public. It is not because medical board is a called medical board, people who have some medical knowledge, who can bring the real knowledge out there. You might think that way, that some physician, I'm not saying that all 100% of physicians, maybe 1%, 2% either make mistakes or they are wrong or they're doing bad things and we are, uh, punishing them, disciplining them, but putting every physician, and especially physician, physicians who have never been the part of CMA, or who have never been on the office bearers of those, and there are many you can find, but putting every physician, telling them that whoever physician is coming there, whether it's an expert, whether they are sitting on the board, or just taking physician side, that is just, just not right. And I want you to say this open in, the, in front of public, in front of my board members and everybody else, that this is not the right approach. There needs to be, a lot needs to be done, and many of the factors you put in there, I actually agree. And actually, that's what I've been thinking. But just attacking physicians because of that, that they are part of that, they're not gonna be making right decisions, I think that is not right, and we need to have more and more discussion. I wanted to say this here, that everybody knows what I'm thinking, what I'm saying. So I need to refocus us, because we're, we really do need to get through um, the board sunset report, and we need to get to a place where we can adopt something 
uh, because we do have a statutory deadline of January, or, or a, a, a legislative deadline, excuse me, not a statutory deadline, uh, a request from the legislature that this report get to them by January 3rd, and we do not have another board meeting scheduled between now and then. This, I mean, the, the I mean, to be frank, what's in our sunset report today is probably the most progressive set of, of proposals to protect the public that the board has ever seen. Mr. Watkins, does it go as far as you would like it to go? Uh, it does not. Um, does it go farther than we've ever gone before, whether it's things like preponderance of the evidence or whether it's the complaint liaison unit, these new complaint uh, tracking systems? It does. Uh, now, I understand your approach is, you know, um, uh, different, but this is an exceptionally progressive set of proposals. We need to get to a place as a board, you know, I'm willing to give us some time to have a conversation, but we need to get to a place as a board where we move towards adopting this sunset report, uh, because that's what the legislature has um, asked of us. I, so I'll, I'll give you a minute, but we need to get on to hearing from all of our board members as well, not just from you. Of course, I, I don't expect it to be about me. I expect it to be about the public. And since you, um, Madam Chair, feel that our legislative proposals are groundbreaking in terms of what the board has done and achieved, that bar is too low. That bar is way too low. The stuff that I'm asking on this, on this, 14 point accountability act is the very basics to ensure legis legally to put people in the driver's seat in the board at, at the board that's it nothing that we have in that proposed legislation that we're going to present at sunset without my proposal addresses <laughs> those issues so that means this thing continues another 30 years and the miscommunication here, yeah, and I want to uh, talk to D Dr. Mahmoud, who I respect and care for deeply, is that I never directed that. At first, my communication was improper, and it sounded like I was just wailing at everybody. <laughs> but I am more focused on not the majority, 90 plus percent great doctors that have reached out to me that have helped me understand that position that Dr. Mahmoud expressed. And so I changed it, that I'm only interested that we do not protect dangerous doctors. That's it. The good doctors fear this board. The bad doctors don't. But while the legal position of the complainants is non-existent, it doesn't matter how we, we dress this up it's not gonna change at the fundamental level. So let's vote, let's get this done. Dr. Hawkins, uh, move to adopt sunset as presented. Dr. Helzer, second. Um, thank you, we have a motion from Dr. Hawkins, a second from Dr. Helzer to adopt the sunset report as written. Uh, are there any further comments from the board members? And then obviously we're gonna have some public comment as well and we'll have further discussion. Uh, Dr. Thorpe. Uh, no, thanks. I, I, I have a comment. I, I'm, I, I, I'm the new guy on the board, and, and I think uh, uh, Mr. Watkins' uh, proposal has a lot of value in it. Um, however, in adopting it in its entirety, I think uh, one of the issues is it directly conflicts because we're asking in the sunset review for an, uh, a fee increase of $1,500. In Mr. Watkins' proposal, he proposes to keep the current fee of $863. So I think, you know, uh, although there are a lot of good things that we can look forward to, uh, hopefully incorporating, uh, adopting it in its entirety uh, would directly conflict with some of our uh, proposals. About that. Thank you, Dr. Sai. Please. Uh, uh, Dr. Thorpe's body language suggests he really wanted to say something. We had some conflict. Yeah, well, Just a doctor. I'm obviously <laughs> conflicted, um, but <laughs> which is not. <laughs> um, it, I agree. I mean, I think there are there are some good things that in this in this 14 point 
thing that uh, Mr. Watkins has proposed. The, the issue I have is process. I got this at, uh, actually, I, I heard about it the morning I arrived here, a Wednesday morning. I, you know, we have, I don't know, a thousand pages of documents to review before this meeting, and, and we, plus our panel issues that need to be reviewed. Um, I had a chance to look at this Wednesday afternoon, and frankly, uh, staff has not had a chance to review it. I, I, I do not think it's the appropriate thing to consider this item as part of sunset review with this short a notice, with this uh, dramatic a change. And frankly, uh, if, if it is necessary, I will move to non-adopt these 14 motions because it's a, a process issue. We haven't had time to uh, re reevaluate it. Thanks, Dr. Thorpe. I just want to look this way and see if anyone has comments before we go to public comment. Can, can I ask a quick question? So if I find an author for a bill that will take all this up, Will this board support that bill then? That's not on our agenda. We can't. I mean, we don't have a oh, bill on no, our agenda. We, I, I, I don't. I don't know how we can I possibly. Think, I think. I think that today. I was just curious because time was always going to be not on our side. I have never been on this board where anything was on time, ever. I get cases on the same day that they are due. So I didn't think that it would be a problem. And that's why it was pretty short. And I thought with the importance of it, that it does represent the public, that it will rise to the highest urgency level. And I could have been wrong in that calculation from what I hear now. And that is OK. Thank you. Other comments? Dr. Bola? Yeah, no, I, I really appreciate the work that you put through. And I have not had a chance to work with you in just recently. And I would agree with Dr. Thorpe. These are big issues, and I too, like Dr. Mahmoud, I have spent my career and will continue, and I hope that I could hear more voices from the advocates besides what we hear at the, at the, at the board meeting. I am a healthcare advocate, have been my entire career, and will continue to be. I concur, and I agree with uh, Mr. Watkins. We have an opportunity it's right now, I think we should continue on with uh, adopting Sunset and that we take your issues, the ones that, that you outlined, and we had that opportunity during strategic planning. I'm just sorry that I didn't have a chance to process this as well because you've raised excellent points. As I know many of you here know, I spent a long time being an expert reviewer. It is not easy and it takes a lot of knowledge to determine whether there's a quality of care issue. Medicine's not cookie cutter. Yes, there are bad doctors. There are the overwhelming majority are good doctors. If the legislator has to change and we need to be able to go forward with that, I'm all for it. I'm not afraid of a good fight. But I do think it has to be packaged, it has to be thought through, and a board has to, your colleagues up here, we need to, to process this with you because you are very uh, clear in your direction. I want to be able to hear it, to feel it, and I can't because I don't have the time to process it. And I'm so for those reasons, it's not that I'm against what you did in your 14 points. I just don't have enough to be able to get into your mind to, to be able to adopt that. So, uh, but there's no criticism about the work. It's just, it's a process. Any additional comments before we open it up for public comment? Uh, Ms. Lubiano. Thank you. Thank you, TJ, for taking the time to, to bring this forward. Um, I did want to express that I, too, did not have enough time to go through this as much as I'd like. I think what would be helpful, um, one thing I think about is in the industry that I work in, everyone wants to put out the best product, and everyone has ideas. And quite honestly, no one gets everything they want. And what comes out essentially is a compromise, but there is an intention from everyone to, to get the best out. So what would be helpful for me um, in, to make this kind of decision is 
kind of like a chart, <laughs> a comparison of what the sunset has, because I hear you, Madam Chair, that there are, there are some, there's some alignment here, and we see, we see value in what TJ has put together. I'd like to see what's in the sunset report, like what lined up, lined up against what you propose to see what those differences are so that I or we can take each one and look at, well, you know, where do we land? Can we find a middle ground or somewhere that makes sense for all of us? I think I don't like to think of things in absolute, like, you know, you say, TJ, oh, it's only this or it's only that. No, I think we can find a way that fits what we're all trying to work for. And I, I'd, I'd really would like to see that and, and look at each one. So I, I don't know if there's a way to make a friendly amendment um, where we, we could pause and take each one and then see how we could meld it into the current report. Because there's a lot here. I don't want to leave it out on the table. Ms. Lubiano, it, does, it, it doesn't line up you know, I just want to be clear that it actually doesn't line up. They are distinct in all of what they are asking. And because a point of order, uh, Madam Chair, is, is, is it appropriate for cross, I mean, in most boards, we address the chair, ask for permission to speak. There's not this back and forth of, I mean, I'm sorry, Mr. Watkins, you've Who had was? your say for the majority of this discussion. You've talked for, I don't know, I didn't even keep them track, but it's about 30 minutes. Absolutely. And the rest of us have not had a chance to talk. So, so you respond, I mean, it just seems to me very inappropriate. So you can have the floor and you can Madam, speak if you're Madam upset Chair. about my speaking on behalf of the public. Madam Chair. Can I make a yeah, comment? Yeah, so well, a cu couple of things. Let me bring this back. So Ms. Lubiano did ask a question about whether or not we can put pause on this, have staff develop um, some additional information and do some additional work and then have us adopt the sunset uh, report. Uh, from my perspective, this is due on January 3rd. We don't have any more time. There isn't time for us to, to have another board meeting in the interim and do that work. What we committed to in October at our strategic planning session was actually to do exactly the work uh, now, outside of the context of the sunset report, uh, Ms. Lubiano, but to do this work and really, um, you know, I, I have a, a draft uh, from um, Solid, from DCA, of what they, you know, heard us say in that session. That'll be coming back to us, I think, in February per, or perhaps at the next board meeting for final approval. But they've they captured the essence of a lot of these things, right? I, you know, improving the enforcement process, including, tra uh, excuse me, improving transparency and complaint and involvement in the process. And I think that's the process for us to evaluate um, sort of more broadly how we can fit these in. If we truly want to figure out how to uh, get in the sense report, I don't know that there's time. I don't believe there's time to do um, that work between now and January 3rd. Can I make a brief comment? <laughs> Dr. Mahmood? Yes. Um, uh, I strongly resent for silencing Mr. Watkin. I think he should have all the all the time available to talk to him because he brought this big effort, big point agenda, and if he wants to clarify and make some comments, I think he should be given all the time. I think uh, we are here to discuss and kind of stuff, but we can set up some time that how much we can spend on this, but uh, I think uh, in all fairness, he should be given every single chance to express whatever he wants to express. I do not agree with everything he's saying, but I do agree that he's saying from good of his heart and he's saying for the betterment of public. Yeah, so, I, d I need to get us on topic though, because otherwise we're not gonna ever get to a point where we, uh, we have a lot of work to do today too. We're off schedule already by about an hour-ish. So um, I'd like to open it up for public comment at this point, unless somebody objects. All right, public comment, please. Um, let me get these slips one second. Okay, I'm gonna start with Kimberly Turbin. I hope I got that name correct. Is Kimberly here in the hearing room? Okay, I'll, I'll put her, we'll circle back. Eric Andrist.
Can you all guess where I stand on this? Mr. CMA Richard Thorpe trying to shut it down, what a surprise. TJ is right, this will look better if this board stands with the public than stands against us. Imagine, imagine that for the first time in history, all of you standing with all of us together on an issue and taking it to the legislature. It's never happened, it's never happened. Everything that happens with this board is the same old rote stuff that's been going on for a hundred years. And that's why you're still here. That's why things are not changing because you're all stuck in the mud doing everything exactly the same way. So a visionary comes along and gives you a present, places it in your lap, and you know, oh yeah, well that's a point of order. Are you? Come on, come on, this is ridiculous. He's also right in that you don't need to look at these proposals. Nothing is new on this list. Shame on you if you are not familiar with any one thing on this list. How is it that Marion and I know more about this stuff than many of you? The strategic planning session was a stroking session for yourselves, not with the public in mind. It's not a process issue. That's a lame excuse to not participate. Richard, if you don't have time to look at this 10 pages from the public, then you're showing your true colors and shouldn't be on this board. Dr. Mahmood, it's not about any one of you individually. You all represent this board as a whole, and when you all sit back and accept the status quo, and then you accept everything that's wrong with this board. Nowhere is the 14-point document attacking you. Nowhere. You need money, but here we are in another expensive hotel that's costing all of us a lot of money while all of your expenses are paid. If you bypass the Accountability Act in favor of the same old garbage that you all ask for every time without success, I will not stand by you at the Sunset Review and will rally the public to tell the legislature that you're once again trying to pull the wool over their eyes, something you do every time. Many of you are so arrogant when you think you know better than everyone else and won't even consider anything new and different. What you have been doing for a hundred years has not worked. So once again, if you shoot this down, you're all, you're all on your own in standing against the public and we will let the legislature know that that is your stance. We have the evidence now, it's going to be on the news, just like stifling public comment for items not on the agenda carry, even though you call for that on your own website. I sent you the information and it was once again ignored. It's proof you don't give a flying leap about the public. A flying leap, Carrie. Wendy Connect. Hello. Um, first, I'd just like to thank TJ again for his incredible insights. And I want to give you some of my insights as a patient and as a complainant. I want to talk first about BMP 2330 and my rights. And I'd like to draw attention. Uh, sorry, <laughs> start over here. Um, as a complainant, when, you, when I contacted the Deputy Attorney General, the DAG, in charge of my case, I'm continually treated in a condescending and disrespectful manner, just like a nuisance and a non-entity in your own case. Further, um, on the subject of not having rights, my legal rights were explicitly and blatantly violated. Section 2330 clearly reads, complainants against licensees of the board, including licensees of allied health boards within the jurisdiction of the board and the board of podiatric me medicine who are subject to formal disciplinary proceedings shall be notified of the actions proposed to be taken against the licensee. That's 2330. I know of no cases where this law is followed, as TJ emphasizes in his Accountability Act. I have emails from Gloria Castro basically telling me, we'll tell you when it's done. You have no right to know anything now. And I can produce those emails at any time, and I would be happy to. This is a flagrant violation of my rights and hundreds of thousands of other complainants through the years, perhaps millions. And sadly, the vast majority of those people are not even aware that they had a right that was violated. Further, as a complainant, I'm not given any documents the doctor wrote in his or her defense, another right that must be restored. It's completely outrageous to discount the complainant. Doctors know they can lie, and they do. In my case, I saw these documents, 10 pages of lies, because we sued. My husband, who is a doctor, and I were outraged that the doctor changed a record over 18 months later, and he did this to substantiate those 10 pages of lies, 
all which he admitted in a deposition that was handed to the medical board. The doctor also put me in an experiment without telling me, using the same devices he was doing studies with on women who had signed consents, implanting a device that ended up exploding inside me. That device was contraindicated for my reconstructive breast surgery, caused me years of pain, and to date, three, reconstruction, re, three reconstructive surgeries, or corrective surgeries, and pain and deformity. The doctor had been paid by Allergan almost half a million dollars to be lead investigator in a study for the exact devices he implanted in me without my consent. That is breaking a federal law. An investigator in a study cannot promote a product as safe when the study is ongoing. I had uh, numerous news reports after my case settled. Nightly News, local NBC4, Fox 11, LA Times, California News Group. Every time a story ran, other people came out to, and reached out to me with their own horror stories of this doctor, which resulted in three more complaints being submitted to the board. Please conclude. Some people were too traumatized and too afraid to write complaints. Sorry, I have a lot because I couldn't speak this morning. No, Ms. Uh, Connect, your time is up. Well, hopefully I'll get a chance to finish. Thank you. Marion Hollingsworth. Good morning, my name is Marion Hollingsworth. First, I'd like to thank Mr. T.A. Watkins for taking the time on the 14 points and for most importantly, for actually caring. As for the board, I would like to encourage you to imagine yourselves as a patient or a loved one for someone who is. We consumers put great faith in our doctors as healers and when we are betrayed and harmed and sometimes deliberately harmed, as my father was, the betrayal is deeper. We look to the board for accountability for ourselves and our loved ones uh, for that harm, but mostly so that no one else suffers the way we have. However, 95% of the time, the board drops our cases, and we feel that betrayal again and again even deeper. And the other doctor goes on to harm again many times. This actually happened in, uh, in my, one of my uh, doctor's cases. If you had listened to me, another patient would be alive today. I warned you about my father's doctor, but you dismissed my complaint and my concerns. This doctor then went on to the death certificate project where he overdosed a patient. To begin these needed changes, I ask that you actually change the Business and Professions Code 2330 so that when we do turn to the board to have our back, we can have equal standing with the doctor. I would think that you would want that if you or your loved one was harmed. And Dr. Sai, if you'd actually read the 14 points carefully, you would have seen that that fee annou announcement was for, or proposal was for every year, not just for two years. So the 8623 would be every year, um, not every two years. So it would affect the, the finances. It, would, it is a good thing. We cannot afford to have an underfunded, understaffed, and undertrained board when we do turn to you. So please consider these changes and please care as, do, as uh, Mr. Watkins cares. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. We have Robert uh, Andrian next. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me here. And my name is Robert Andrian, and I am from Orange County, and I am a volunteer with the Consumer Watchdog. <clears throat> I support the Accountability Act because there is no accountability for my mother. My mother was a well-respected person within her community in Orange County. She was a hairstylist. She did hair for the stars, and uh, she was a business owner, had her own hair salon. She died tragically, following an angioplasty and a deadly stent operation. My mom never had a heart attack or a stroke or bad chest pain issues before this deadly operation. <clears throat> the doctor spoke with my mother over the phone and mentioned he had a meeting with three other, car three other cardiologists and none of them were comfortable 100 
percent. They were two were totally completely against this medical practice, and only one was 50-50, and he wished her the best of luck. There, you know, and uh, no one was approving this within uh, the Heart Association in Orange County. My mother's health insurance approved only one stent and one angioplasty. Her doctor proceeded with a stent operation after the Orange County Heart Institute was against this recommendation. Her procedure was scheduled and she laid there in the hospital with a gown on, about to be wheeled into OR when the doctor said he didn't have the right medical tool for this operation, which was called an Impala. The procedure was canceled. My mother was stunned. A year later, the doctor coached my mom going in and telling her to go into ER and to tell her to say something that's false. Say, say that you have bad chest pain. And go into ER at this time. And my mom wanted to believe that this cardiologist doctor really cared about her. She, my, I hate to see it, we, we were naive and too trusting. And uh, he never showed up. The EKGs came up negative on my mom at the hospital. So then he did it again and told her and coached her what time to go back in the ER at the same hospital where he works and say that she's having bad, bad chest pain when she wasn't. The doctor told my mom it was a small, very safe operation and she would be in and out like a fast food in one to two days and good to go home. Please my mom, conclude. I'm Please sorry. conclude. Okay. My, my mom's understanding was only one to three stents total. The, and within the second ER visit, the, the cardiologist showed up and he inserted eight stents in my mom's heart. The hospital called me and told me that my mom was having trouble breathing, but she wasn't alive. I showed up right away. She was dead. The, and they also told my mom's Sir, sister. Your time is up. Okay. Thank you. I have Tracy Dominguez next. I just ask you to speak in the microphone so we Sorry. thank this you. This is Danny and this is Malachi and he is not a fetus and this is Danny and Xavier. Uh, I ask you to have a little bit of patience with me because this is extremely nervous and uh, emotional for me. I drove two hours in the rain to get here and just to say her name makes me cry. So I just ask you please please be patient because it could be your daughter next and grief is really hard okay so I am Tracy and I'm from Bakersfield and I am a volunteer with consumer watchdog I support the accountability act because there is no accountability for mothers and babies in Bakersfield including for my daughter Demi and my grandson Malachi one of the reasons why you allow so one of the reasons why you allow so many mothers and babies to be harmed and died under a care of one of Bakersfield's doctors for 25 years is because we have no legal rights. Had other families had legal rights to communicate with this board during the complaint review, the two babies that died and the two mothers that died and Celeste Ortiz died, maybe the board might have had taken action on this repeat offender much sooner instead of allowing him to leave, to leave a 25-year trail of, of death and harm in Bakersfield. Demi would be alive. We need the right to offer up our statement after physician's statement. We, had we had the right, I could have offered you the CHP 
the CDHP documents that proved and verified the accusations of no treatment, no diagnosis for clear-cut preeclampsia. We need the right to interview before our death complaint is dismissed. Why didn't you end this doctor's trail of death and destruction earlier? They would be here. Had you already adopted the DC complaint authorization uh, guidelines and the other health care bo uh, boards allow you, you would have had to discipline his license to the extent ne necessary much earlier. We need you to adopt the DC prioritization guidelines as a legislation priority at the Sunset Review. This is the only way to manage a repeat offender and save lives. I had to walk her graduation a month after she passed. She was graduating to receive her bachelor's degree in psychology. She was prepared for her life to make a better life for herself. And this board allowed this doctor to continue practicing with a trail of 25 years of harming. How is that doing your job? How I did he get through? Please conclude. Thank you. Excuse me, thank you. Tammy and Tim Smick um, next. I'm not sure whether you want to speak separately or together. Hi, good morning. I'm Tammy Smick. I'm here with my husband, Tim Smick. We are patient advocates, and we're the parents of Alex Smick. We would like to express our sincere thanks to T.J. Watkins for his courage to come forward and expose the corruption that we have all witnessed in the medical board of California. Mr. Watkins, you are a true hero to us and to all patients in California. We wholeheartedly support Mr. Watkins' Accountability <coughs> Act, and we ask the board to back the Patient Bill of Rights legislation, something we have been pushing for eight years. This would give consumers a voice in the enforcement process, make discipline more robust, and provide for more transparency. Our 20-year-old son, Alex, was killed by medical malpractice. In an Orange County hospital, Alex was prescribed and given a lethal combination of medications, and then because the doctor wrote an order to only check his vitals while he was awake, Alex was left in his hospital bed for more than seven hours, and when he was finally checked on during morning rounds, Alex was found dead. He was already in rigor mortis. We filed a complaint with the Medical Board of California, and that process took four long years. It took the board two years to even interview the doctor while he continued to practice unscathed. And even though an accusation was filed against Dr. Daniel J. Hedrick with a petition to revoke his license, a secret backroom deal was struck and Dr. Hedrick got away with a public reprimand, little more than a slap on the wrist for killing Alex. We were informed via email of the board's decision. There was no decency. We were involved. We called repeatedly. We sent emails. We provided documents, and the board did not have the decency to pick up the phone to call us 
we received an email and then we had to weed through pages to find out the board's decision. And in our case, like countless of others, this board went out of its way to protect a dangerous doctor and not the public, and it is shameful. It's time, it is way past time for the board to fulfill its mission of protecting the public and not to protect dangerous doctors. Ms. Smith, please conclude. Thank you. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. I have Carmen Volver up next. Thank you, Carmen Balber. I'm the executive director of Cons executive director of Consumer Watchdog, and I just want to draw a fine point on the fact that nearly everything that was in the Accountability Act that Mr. Watkins finally put down in writing for you, because you haven't done that work, and is in the Patient Bill of Rights, which we provided you this week, and we're outside your board meeting providing you eight years ago are things that you have heard from every single patient who has testified either in person or remotely to this board. You have heard them testify in those two multi-hour hearings last year when the board was under investigation in the prior year for the Sunset Review. These are not new ideas. These are questions, concerns, and requests that the public has made of you year after year after year. So this is not a surprise. Mr. Watkins just wrote it all down for you, like patient advocate advocates have done for years in the past. These requests are simple. Many of them you could approve today. Increased transparency for patients. So for example, when a doctor has a repeat history of harming someone and is under current investigation by the board, his current patients have a right to know that. That would have protected one family who testified here today. Another example is a simple consumer right to a voice in the process. Interview complainants before you dismiss their complaint. It's not a hard concept to make sure you have all of the information before you decide to just take the doctor's word for it and close a complaint and provide adequate enforcement so you don't go to the attorney general's office with a recommendation that a doctor lose their license for negligently killing someone and end up with a letter of reprimand. There is no sense to a movement like that. So each of these things has been before the board for years. I think what you're hearing from the public is that it is, it's time. There is no more time for, the deba for debate. It's time for this board to listen to the public, hear these calls for change, and actually do something. So if you don't want to adopt word for word from uh, what Mr. Watkins wrote down, or word for word the patient bill of rights that we've been submitting to you, talk about these concepts, decide what you can put in the sunset review today, and move forward because there's no more time for debate. Patients are dying. It's the reason that you had two multi-hour sessions of the sunset review because the, even the legislature recognizes that you're not doing enough. It's the reason you're back after two years instead of four because the legislature decided they could not wait for you to tell them how, they were, how you were reforming your process so more patients don't die. Thank you. Thank you. I have Madeline Weisner next. Hello, I'm Madeline Weisner with the California Association of Licensed Midwives. First off, I would like to thank medical board staff for your continued support for a licensed midwife board in this sunset report. Ms. Weisner, can I have you speak up a bit, please? Sure, sure thing. The rate of midwife attended home birth and birth center births has increased dramatically in California and nationwide since early 2020. In an overburdened health system, more families have sought out midwifery care, which is skilled, affordable, and performed closely in partnership with birthing families. 
Over the last three years, more families than ever have had their care paid for by Medi-Cal managed care plans, or not paid for, but covered, directly addressing class disparities in maternal and perinatal health outcomes. I need not discuss the health benefits and cost benefits of licensed midwife care as they are well documented, given that all countries in the world that have better outcomes than the US have midwives as lead maternity carers for their families. Meanwhile, licensed midwives and consumers of midwife care, both rapidly growing groups, continue to be trapped in a regulatory stalemate. The Sunset Report is unfortunately unclear about this. We already practice independently under the Business and Professions Code. However, the failure to promulgate our regulations has lasted for years. This has prevented us from being able to bill for CPSP services through Medi-Cal to help more low-income and rural families. This stalemate has contributed to outdated guidelines and misinformed standards of care being used to investigate and discipline midwives. We know that staff agrees a licensed midwife board is indicated, necessary, and appropriate to bring maternity care in California to the highest standard. The segments in the report addressing the costs and revenues of the licensed midwife program are incomplete. We appreciate that questions about the costs of a licensed midwife board will continue until we can have a full and transparent accounting of the true costs of the existing program. Calm calls on the medical board to join with us in this effort, beginning with a thorough audit of the licensed midwife program and the licensed midwifery fund. Thank you. Thank you. I have Kimberly Turbin next. Hello, my name is Kimberly Turbin. I'm from Los Angeles, California. I'm a volunteer with Consumer Watchdog. I'm here today because I've been coming here since about 2020, but the, um, the stories of the women that are dying in Bakersfield have been haunting me because I myself went through something, but you know, I made it out alive with a doctor that should not have been practicing either, that nobody had the balls to face or bring down. Um, I support the Accountability Act. The enforcement process is failing too many Californians. When you are looking at only 1.5% of complaints that make it to an accusation, then you know we have a problem. We shouldn't even be debating about investigating death complaints. What is there to debate? A Californian dies needlessly due to negligence. There should be an automatic referral to investigation. There is not a referral with the board, but there is with other healthcare related boards, and that's wrong. Please adopt the DCA prioritization guidelines to ensure that quality of care deaths and serious bodily injury complaints are referred to investigation. We need legal rights for complainants and families in the enforcement process. Once we send in our complaint, you exclude us from the entire enforcement process. Families should have an input in each step of the process. We should have the right to provide information following the physician's interview. We should have the right to an interview before our quality of care death or seriously bodily injury cases are dismissed. This information should be made available to you and the board, to you, the board, and so you can make a fair and adequate decision. We need you to include these recommendations as legislative priority and sunset review issues. Um, thanks. Thank you. 
Those are all the speaker slips I have for people in the hearing room. Was there anybody else that wanted to speak? Oh, Michelle Montserrat Ramos. Good morning. Uh, my name is Michelle Montserrat Ramos, and I'm with Consumer Watchdog. I've been coming before this board for 17 years now. 17 years. And I've watched really hard times like today. Early in my advocacy years, I was one or two people that advocated to terminate the Confidential Physician Diversion Program. And that board listened to consumers. And that board courageously stood by consumers and terminated that program because they agreed it was putting Californians at risk. There were other things that occurred after that with, with consumer-related legislation that was passed the uniform standards, as you know which I spent five years of my life before this board pushing the board to place the law and regulations, and that was a battle as well. Um, you'll probably remember, it was probably a couple strategic sessions, planning sessions ago, and it was just the board and me. There was no one else from the public in the room. And I think probably the only public board member here was Board President Lawson that was at that meeting. And some of the items that are in the Accountability Act were some of the issues that I brought forward. And I remember clearly that the public board members rallied for those changes and put them in as objectives for that strategic planning session. But those objectives in a few meetings disappeared. And I asked Kim, I, who was the executive director at the time, I asked him what happened. I mean, our public board members rallied for these changes, and she told me, well, Michelle, we met with DCA, and they eliminated them. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of history. These, these changes that we're asking for, they're not new, like Carmen and so many people have mentioned, you know, We've been pushing for these changes for years. And it's not easy to, to come before this board, like Tracy and so many of the new advocates. It's not easy. It's not easy to put your grief here on the table and push for change for other Californians. But we do this. I was put in that position to do that. And as you know, yesterday I said that tomorrow's Lloyd's birthday, but in next month will be the 20th anniversary of his death. And it really pains me to sit in the audience today knowing Lloyd, who actually fought for the rights of all Californians, who was a Latino political leader throughout California, not just California, but the Southwest. He fought for the rights of other people, but when he died, there were no rights for him. And uh, amazingly, when I followed that consumer complaint here, he still had no rights. And I didn't either. His complaint was dismissed at the Central Complaint Unit, and that's why I continue to be here, but I just wanted you to know a little bit of the history, that these issues aren't new, and I really wish that you would move forward with some of them, especially the consumer, com the consumer um, communication issues. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the hearing room that wishes to speak? All right, seeing none, let's go to the phone. Looks like we have 10 or 12 or 11. <laughs> okay, we'll, so we'll get started. Our first comment comes from Susan Morin. Your line is now open. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, okay. I'm Susan Lauren. I support the Accountability Act. Um, this is long overdue. Uh, I went in for a breast reduction. You all know my story. Salberger stabbed me up a multitude of times with a power tool from my waist to my shins for absolutely no reason, leaving me incredibly mutilated in 
antenna, whatever. You know my story. I can't be there with you today. I'm just going to come be quiet for a minute. I can't be with you there today because of the severe mutilation. I've been housebound for over 11 years. I'm in a prison that he put me in. I didn't do anything wrong. I can't even go down the street to buy an apple. T.J. Watkins, a compassionate, creative visionary, is appropriately outraged. He has taken appropriate action. All this back and forth, oh, we can't do this, we can't do that. Come on. My life ended from this. And then the board continues to ignore my, okay, I want to just not have this tone. I'm just upset. Let me, the board continues to ignore my request to prevent harm to consumers. My legal rights were violated in the medical board and civil court because many, there are many bad players, including Terry Dubrow, your medical board expert. Now, number 11 on the Accountability Act, you should, that's something that you should have taken up a long time ago. Read number 11. Let's look at it now, everyone. Okay? You have to update the board's expert reviewer requirements. That shouldn't be, oh, gee, we need to look at this. Um, the, the, the basis of your medical board is supposed to be who your medical board experts, and you are in the doghouse with that. My case didn't have a chance to settle honestly. I am at risk for homelessness, and there's no, there's no compassion from you. I've never had an honest, compassionate answer from you. I've met hundreds of people during my advocacy, read thousands and thousands and thousands of reviews. I've been researching this for years. What are all of you doctors who claim that you're such good doctors? What are you doing to stop the scam from the plastic and cosmetic surgeons? These are real scams. These are really harming people. There's no science behind it. They're harmful to the, um, to the whole system. They're taking healthy people's lives and putting them at risk, and that's not medicine. Uh, my, it's, I, w I was in the healthcare field. My father was a doctor. That's not me good medicine. And you're a fraternity of doctors protecting doctors, and there's also number four on that accountability thing about the majority of public members. Well, I agree with that, but I also... Um, think we need to question who the public members are. For a while, you had Alejandro Campo Verde on there who has a video that promotes liposuction as some kind of magic. you got to look at who all your members are. Please and conclude. if anyone is thinking of running, okay, same golf, good doctors are good doesn't make it so. Um, I want you all to speak up and do the right thing and pass this bill. It's, we have no rights. And that's ridiculous. Thank you, TJ. Thank you so much. to the next commenter, please. Our next comment comes from Denise Johnson. Your line is now open. Good morning, Madam President, members of the board. My name is Denise Johnson. I'm from Tracy and a volunteer with Consumer Watchdog. I support the Accountability Act because I know from personal experience that there is no accountability for California patients with this board. There was no accountability for my son, Richard. Richard had survived a brain tumor, but needlessly died from a preventable infection. I filed complaints against three doctors in three separate hospitals, and I received three cold dismissal form letters. It is shameful that a California can die in a hospital and there's no investigation no communication with the surviving family, no interview, nothing. It's time for change. We need you to, do, to adopt the DCA complaint prioritization guidelines for all quality of care death complainants, that they must go to investigation as other health care boards follow, and you must change the business and professions code to ensure that the complainant or surviving family member is interviewed before their quality of care complaint is dismissed. We need you to, hold, to add both of these changes to the sunset report and add legislative priorities. The time is now. Thank you, Mr. Watson, for your time, your effort, and your attention to patients. It is very much appreciated. Thank you to the board for listening. Goodbye. Thank you. The next comment, please. Next comment comes from Naomi Sweat. Your line is not open. 
Hi, um, I am Naomi Sweat. I'm from San Diego, and um, Bakersfield is my hometown. I volunteer with Consumer Watchdogs. I support the Accountability Act because I want accountability for my little sister, Sabrina De La Rosa, and all mothers in the Central Valley. I support a notice of doctors under investigation. In my sister Sabrina's case, her doctor was on um, probation for harming other women and for sexual misconduct, paying his patients for cash paying patients cash for sex when he was providing care for my sister. We had no idea that his office had been ra raided. He had been arrested and was charged with 27 felony counts. This information needs to be cited directly on the physician's profile and not hidden 20 pages into, into a public document. I support that this board adopt the DCA complaint criteria guidelines, which calls for quality of care death complaints to be referred to investigation. These DCA guidelines are based on current laws that nurses have to follow, but doctors do not. These steps towards accountability and transparency would have saved my little sister's life and so many other young women in Central Valley. When these young mothers die, many of them leave behind young children motherless. We are talking about a loss of life, but this loss is due to negligence and it also destroys entire families. Please include these recommendations Thank you. Thank you. The next public comment, please. Next comment comes from Joseph Cervantes. Your line is not open. Hi. Good morning, Madam Chair and board members, as well as members of the public. I am a normal human being like all of you with no special ties to the medical industry other than someone who uses the medical system. I understand everyone's passion and can empathize with all of you that these are serious situations that can cause a lot of emotional dialogue and banter. I appreciate Mr. Watkins' proposal, but want to point out some facts. It takes many years of study and preparation to become a doctor. In addition to four years of undergraduate pre-medicine studies and four years of medical school, it may take another three to seven years, residencies and specializations, before a doctor starts to hit, starts his own practice. Additionally, doctors make, must take continuing education courses throughout their tenure. With all that education and training, a patient should feel safe going to a doctor, right? Well, not necessarily, because more than 250,000 deaths each year are caused by medical errors. In fact, medical errors are the third leading cause of death in the United States, preceded only by heart disease and cancer. Not only doctors, but all healthcare professionals have a duty to provide health care that falls within what is known as the standard of care. California's civil jury instructions define the standard of care as the level of skill knowledge and care in diagnosis and treatment that other reasonably careful practitioners would use in the same or similar circumstances. And I can tell you that I am aware of a particular physician who did not practice that standard of care and who continued to hurt individuals even after the Medical Board of California was investigating this individual and they found in a prima facie case that he was guilty of gross negligence. Now in a criminal court, Criminal, in a criminal court, gross negligence manslaughter is a real thing. And how there is no point of emphasis within this board to submit these claims or these, these deaths that happen at the hands of a physician for investigation by the local police department is beyond me. I hope, and I understand that there's, you have your, your, the medical board uh, manual of uh, model disciplinary orders and discipline, uh, disciplinary guides, I think the most troubling thing in there is that you aid in the rehabilitation of licenses and there's nothing that goes beyond there. There's nowhere in the remainder of the guidelines does it indicate that you have a fiduciary responsibility to notify the police of that gross negligence. And it doesn't even fall under whether or not that individual has been convicted of a crime. And I think this is a mismanagement other than a slap on the hand and the wrist. So I hope you can all come to a consensus of the 14 points that was provided and work with legislators to get these gaps closed. Folks, people are dying at the hands of these negligent physicians. This needs to be a priority in your agenda. I am a constituent of the governor of California, and his desk is the next place my voice will land if your board does not take action. We need accountability now. Thank you. Thank you. Next public comment, please. Next comment comes from Christina Hildebrand. Your line is not open. 
Hi, Christina Hildebrand from A Voice for Choice Advocacy. We educate and advocate for informed choice and transparency in what goes into your body. Uh, I'm going to take a breath because there's a lot that's being said, and, and I agree with much of it or most of it. Um, I want to say thank you to CJ for uh, adding this Accountability Act and writing it down, and, and I think the comment that this has been said for years and years, and I, you know, I'm one of those people that shows up at every board meeting and says the same thing, and it falls on deaf ears. Um, I would ask the board to not rush this and to allow time today to talk about this. If you need to go home at 2 o'clock, then create another meeting in the next few weeks to talk about this because it's important. It's important to all the patients that you're supposed to represent. And so if you can't go through this point by point today, by either to add it, or whether or not to add it, then take the time the next two weeks to do that before you have to submit your stuff to legislation in January. Do that for all the people that are here today and that have been at your meetings year after year after year. Please, please do that. I will say again what I said yesterday, which is A Voice for Choice Advocacy is a legislative advocacy group for informed choice and transparency. We have taken on not all 14 points, but about five, probably five of them that we already have and are already stopping uh, for, uh, for a bill to the legislature. It's not an easy process. It's a time-consuming process. It's, you know, it, one of the people on here, the public has uh, person had a bill go through last year and it passed, but it was completely gutted. The other thing that's medical board needs to do in the legislature is you need to have us public behind you. You can't be fighting us in your sunset reviews or you're going to get another sunset review in two years' time because the legislature listens to the public. You're failing us. You need to get on board and you need to work out how to have more power than the CMA because currently any bill that you bring forward, the CMA just opposes and they win. And yes, they have money in the legislature, but somehow the medical board should have more power than a physician association. So please work that out. If you need help, a voice for choice advocacy would be happy to help with that, those efforts. It is impossible. It's really hard when we have the CMA against us and the medical board has no power in that building. And you have no power in that building because you're failing your patients. You're failing the public. So please, please do this today. If you can't do it today because you have to leave at 2 o'clock and you have to do the executive director, you know, closed-door meeting, then please set something up before January and have us involved and ha get this book out. But don't ignore it. Don't let it go. You need to have Please conclude. In January. Thank you. Thank you. The next comment, please. Our next caller comes from Monty Goddard. Your line is not open. Um, thank you for this opportunity to provide public comment. This has been a very interesting agenda item. In contrast, my request is simple. My name is Monty Goddard, and for the record, I'm grateful to Dr. Thorpe's, Mr. Persifis, and Mr. Brooks' efforts to update and improve the board's opioid prescribing guidelines. I actively participated in the board's ongoing updates of their 2014 opioid prescribing guidelines at their interest parties meetings and the full board's August quarterly meeting. At these meetings, both Dr. Thorpe and Executive Director Persifka voiced concerns. Publishing of the updated opioid prescribing guidelines alone would not remedy, and noted an aggressive outreach education program must accompany their release. These concerns related to the well-established and very real fear of physicians in prescribing opioids and pharmacists in filling opioid prescriptions. Another concern related to getting insurance companies out of practicing medicine was voiced by Dr. Hawkins. For the past couple of years, now California Senate Majority Leader Mike McGuire and his staff have met with several pain patient advocates seeking legislative relief for California's innocent, vulnerable, unjustly suffering pain patients. While supporting is yet to introduce such legislation, citing COVID-related backlog in the legislature. According to his staff, this backlog may be easing. On October 25th, I requested Senator McGuire propose legislation to amend California's health and safety codes, pain patient bill rights, 
by adding two sentences from this past August enacted Minnesota, in my terminology, pain patient relief. These two sentences explicitly protect physicians and pharmacists prescribing and filling opioid medications for the treatment of pain and prohibit insurance companies from refusing to cover related charges. I provided the requisite detail of this request and written comment to the board last week on November 23rd. I hope you've had the opportunity to review it. Amending California's Pain Patient Bill of Rights to explicitly protect physicians and pharmacists, as Minnesota has done, will not only go a long way in allaying doctors and pharmacists fears around opioid prescribing, but will also send a powerful message to health insurers, pharmacy benefit managers. Medical Board publishing its updated opioid prescribing guidelines in conjunction with an aggressive education outreach program and the suggested amendment to California's Pain Patient Bill of Rights would absolutely be a powerful, synergistic triad for good. Please strive to make all three happen. Thank you. Thank you. Next pub public comment, please. Next comment comes from Xavier De Leon. Your line is not open. Hello, my name is Xavier, and I'm from Bakersfield, California, with Consumer Watchdog. Um, I support the Accountability Act because there was no accountability for my son. I was so excited to be a father, um, and now I'll never get to experience that. I wanted so much for him, uh, but I am incredibly grateful and will never forget the short time that I got to hold him. Um, he was born He was born postpartum C-section because the doctor that he was supposed to be overseeing him and his mother's care never even saw them. He was a 25-year repeat offender who had no idea, and we had no idea he had harmed and been responsible for the deaths of many young mothers and babies. Following his postmortem C-section, he was not given the correct medication he needed in time to treat his lungs, which was just the beginning of a cascade of errors that led to my son's death. He only got to live for 18 hours, and on top of that, the enforcement process was a nightmare. We were told not to file a complaint because it wouldn't even matter. In his mother's investigative documents, my son was noted as a fetus who lived and died. He was so much more than that, though. Had the board adopted the DCA prioritization guidelines, then my son's complaint would have been referred to investigation. He at least deserved that much. Please make this right for other families and other babies and move to adopt the DCA complaint prioritization guidelines as a legislative recommendation and sunset review issue. And going back to what a nightmare the enforcement process is, something that would help us is giving us the legal rights in the enforcement process. Um, how could you really sit there and listen to us relive our tragedies and not afford us equal rights to the rights that doctors have? With legal rights, the families that filed consumer complaints for their daughters and babies' deaths would have been received the account and they would have received the accountability they deserved. The accountability for other families might have saved my son's life. We need the right to offer the follow-up statement following the doctor's statement. We need to make we need the right to an interview before a death complaint is dismissed. Please make granting patients legal rights a legislative priority and sunset review issue. Thank you. Thank you. Next public comment, please. Our next comment comes from Virginia Farr. Your line is not open. Hello. Thank you very much for doing this, TJ, taking the time to do this. And the speech you had at the beginning was very moving. Also, thank you for those who found the other ga gaps in care and presented those. Um, about time and not having time. Those who speak before me and thousands of others have lost all their time with their family from the time of the incident forever on, and then they have to waste their time going through this process for 20 years getting things to change. And if you did what they asked you to do 20 years ago, many of those people wouldn't have lost their families. They would still enjoy their time with the family. They're spending holidays with their family right now. But instead, we're here begging for change 
once again, because you didn't change back then. And we lost our loved ones. We lost our time. I've lost 12 years of my life, over a million dollars, and you're worried about a little bit of time. How about all the time that you're going to affect for the people who are affected when you don't do this? How about their time? Because all these people are going to be losing their time because you can't take the time to address it now. And unfortunately, I didn't have the honor of sitting with CJ to um, put in my input. But first, none of this is going to matter because the CMA is going to gut it. So what are you going to do about the CMA? Because that needs to be, time needs to be addressed for that. Second, we need funding for prevention. I've been saying this for over a year now. And we asked the legislature for funding so we can put preventative measures in place so everybody can enjoy the time with their families and loved ones and not have to deal with this. We need trauma-informed training, funding for a marginalized study for those impacted by medical errors, like I said today. And there's something else I don't remember. But anyway, please take the time to address this and take the time to stand by the legislator and do it right so not more people are harmed. We can't keep going around and around and around doing this for another 50 years. As people lose their lives, and I don't know what to say. I just really wish that you guys can just get it together and we don't beg. And, oh, and if you want to silence us like you did this morning, the best way to silence us is to do this, get it right, so we don't have to come beg you, and then we'll be silent. We'll be out of your hair. We won't be anywhere near you if you just do it right and protect us like you're supposed to do. So thank you, and please do all that stuff. So we can be silent because I would love to be silent because I just wasted three hours of my day today. Um, thanks. Thank you. Next public comment, please. Next comment comes from Dr. Ree. Your line is now open. Oh. Yes, hello. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Yes, thank you. So um, we have tried to call, and we have been hung up on 14 times. We sent comments to the webmaster. Webmaster has refused to post or to state any of our comments. We offer a solution um, to all, all of the problems. Um, firstly, Mr. Watkins, sir, I'm going to tell you what's up, okay? So this is Dr. Reed from Black Patients Matter. I'm going to tell you because nobody else has told you. Eric Andrus and, um, what's that gal name? But Eric Andrus and the other gal are racist. All right, they're racist. They marginalize our group, Black Patients Matter. They don't even want to sit by us in the meetings. As you can see, they never told us about a uh, meeting with you. They left us out. They are racist. And as the other Black folks here know, all right, you got to be careful about being used by the white folks. There's a name for that when white folks use a black man. So I'm telling you this because you got to be careful. Those two are racist. Constantly marginalizes us. Constantly leaves us out. Never acknowledges us as black patients matter. In addition to that, we offer the we I uh, want to thank the California Assemblyman who's reached out to us and is working with us on legislation for mediation. Mediation will work. Mediation will save a lot of money, a lot of time, and it will work. Secondly, um, the other solution that we have 
for every single concern and complaint that you have given, whether it be not enough money, um, no one calls us back, the GA's office, and AG's office doesn't even show up, let alone call patients back. We offer something that's perfect. You, as the medical board, need to outsource. Outsource much of the process to places like India, Ireland, Australia, where they have the label, uh, excuse me, where they have the labor and the process. Don't cut me off. No one has allowed me to speak all day. And I have submitted comments. Believe me, as you know, Ms. Carey, Mr. Andrews, everyone knows. Commenter, please. We will file a lawsuit. So, Next going commenter, back to please. this, you know, medical boards need to outsource. You need to outsource. Operator, the please go to the next so commenter. Thank you. Next comment, please. Next comment comes from Susan Sunazi. Line is not open. Hello, this is Susan Shanazi. Um, I have experienced a lack of accountability on the board's part too and in, in many different ways. But I do want to say that um, having been a former nurse, I've worked with many doctors and, and all types of healthcare professionals. But, and I know that the vast majority are very good people. I do also know that their hands are tied with uh, policies and laws and uh, they too can fall victim to the systemic flaws. So I do speak up to them also on hospital watchdog so we can correct that. And as a volunteer with consumer watchdog, I support the accountability. Ah. In medicine though, it seems what's happened is the hierarchy of medicine is alive and well. And that includes a lack of space for that's a deviation that has become normalized, and that's unacceptable. As healthcare workers, and even as a culture, we need to respect every single life as important and equal. And we need to help ensure that every single person has equal rights. I hear, and I know you do not have much money. I've heard that for 20 years. I hear you don't have the time, most likely related to the money issues. I've even heard that the medical industry is the only industry in the United States that is not a democracy. And it's time to change that because it is proving to be true. The healthcare community can uh, help change this by putting the care back into healthcare and accepting, willingly accepting and implementing the rights of every person and the importance of every life. And I, I thank you. I thank all the very good healthcare people that do believe in that too. I'm alive today because it's very good healthcare professionals and doctors after being injured by medical harm. I've seen both sides and I know we can all do this together. Let's improve. Okay. Now. Thank you. Thank you. Next commenter, please. Next comment comes from Alka Airy. Your line is now open. Hello, uh, my name is Alka Airy. I'm from San Francisco. I'm a volunteer at Consumer Watchdog. I speak on behalf of my sister, Shulpa, who lost her life to medical negligence. I support Mr. Watson's Accountability Act and commend his efforts to put patient safety first. I also support a patient bill of rights. The provisions of both go beyond restoring public trust and will deliver meaningful consequences for negligent doctors. Greater accountability means better health outcomes, for all patients, 
which is ultimately what we all want. I hope the board will consider adopting these provisions for the sunset report and supporting its inclusion in future legislation. I also want to commend this board for recognizing the value of a public board member majority and supporting legislation in favor of it. The board's continued support sends a strong message across the state and the nation too that California is committed to safeguarding patient safety. I sincerely hope our lawmakers and the governor recognize the significance of taking this small yet powerful step on behalf of all consumers. I support the board's recommendations for changing the evidentiary standard to preponderance of evidence and increasing fees as proposed. I also support creating a complainant liaison unit. However, I'm concerned not enough attention has been directed toward the stage of the complaint process where 90% of complaints are dismissed and how the liaison unit will handle this stage. I was one of these complainants whose complaint was quickly dismissed without action, without any interviews, and without consideration of outside records. We are told our complaints will be investigated, but they really aren't, because only 10% get referred to the investigations department where they are actually investigated. The Sunset Report glosses over this critical stage of the complaint process, and yet it remains at the heart of public distrust. There are a few things I wish the board had recommended, and I hope you will reconsider such as mandatory interviews for all complaints, careful consideration of all medical records and not just those selected by a hospital, and opportunities for injured patients and their families to provide impact statements. If doctors are allowed to appeal decisions, then it seems only fair for complainants to have similar access to an appeal process. Complaints involving patient death should also go directly to investigation per the DCA complaint prioritization process there should be some consistency across DCA agencies. My sense after reviewing the Sunset Report and attending several meetings is that the medical board doesn't have a strong understanding of consumer sentiment, of what matters most to consumers and why we feel current oversight is inadequate. Obtaining 29 responses over two years for a consumer survey is indeed inadequate to draw any conclusions, but it is telling that even with so few responses, they are resoundingly negative toward the medical board. If the board can't convince 29 consumers of its effectiveness, then how does it expect to gain the respect and support of 40 million residents? Please conclude. Doctors aren't the medical board's only stakeholder. Consumers are stakeholders, too. Thank you. Thank you. Next public comment, please. Next comment comes from Mark Wilson. Your line is now open. Uh, hi there. My name is Mark Wilson. I'm uh, from Newport Beach. I'm a recently retired senior executive with Taco Bell Corporation, and I'm a volunteer with Consumer Watchdog. I, my mom uh, died in 2020 due to medical negligence, and it's interesting. I asked a number of people, should I file a complaint with the medical board? And everybody, by name, said, waste of time. The medical board doesn't do anything to keep doctors accountable. And that's why I'm supporting the Accountability Act for California. The bottom line is that families need legal rights in the enforcement process. Once our consumer complaint is accepted, we must be granted the right to offer follow-up statements following the doctor's statement. Our evidence we collect later must be accepted and weighed equally to the evidence the physician provides. We must have the right to appear and give evidence at panel hearings and office of administrative hearings. All quality of care deaths and serious bodily injury complaints must be referred to investigation per the DCA prioritization guidelines. Change the business profession, business and profession code to ensure that you mandate that the DCA complaint prioritization guidelines be followed. Show us that you choose to meet your mission and accept these recommendations as legislative priorities and sunset reviews. So that's kind of the technical recommendations. Um, I've been on many executive boards and I know that, that the, the source of funding is a big issue. It's not on this prior table, but I believe that because the CMA provides funding, that is a big problem with this process. If the legislature needs to provide funding for this board for it to be truly a patient rights advocate. So this is a great first step, the Accountability Act, but we've got to change the whole funding process so that this board is a lot more objective and not in the pocket of doctors. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Next commenter, please. 
Our next comment comes from Annette Ramirez. Your line is now open. Hi, my name is Annette Ramirez. Um, I'm from Manhattan Beach. I'm a volunteer with Consumer Watchdog. I'm also the mother of two and a former professional at the University of California, Berkeley, and also at the University of Southern California. However, I say former because I can no longer work. I fully support the Accountability Act because I had absolutely no accountability for the egregious, life-altering harm I endured, which cost me the loss of all four of my limbs. I expected to spend a few days in the hospital recovering from a hysterectomy. I had no idea that my doctor had perforated my colon and left me with an infection and sepsis. At some point I knew I was in trouble, but no one would help me. Having waited too long to treat my sepsis, I was left to fight for my life. Spending two years in the hospital away from my family, my children were only six and 12 at the time. My body had been burnt from the inside out. All of this at no fault of my own. I now spend my life in a wheelchair. I filed a complaint with the medical board and I was simply devastated when I received a basic form letter stating that my complaint was dismissed at the central complaint unit with no interview and no communication with me. How could the loss of my arms and legs not be worthy of an investigation? You are dismissing too many complaints like mine. We need legal rights in the enforcement process, similar to the rights that doctors already now enjoy. We are calling on the board today to make sure that a complainant is interviewed before their quality of care case is dismissed. You need to adopt the DCA complaint prioritization and referral guidelines, which other healthcare professional boards follow. These guidelines would have rated my loss of all four limbs as urgent, and my complaint would have been referred to investigation. Your mission is to protect consumers. You need to show us that you are meeting your mission of protecting patients by making these recommendations a legislative priority and a sunset review issue. I thank you today and I thank you, Mr. Watkins. Thank you, next commenter, please. Our next comment comes from Helena Patas. Your line is not open. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, Hello? we can. Please, please go ahead. Thank you. My name is Helena Pappas. My comment goes to the failure of the medical board and the attorney general to enforce laws already on the books about the alteration and falsification of medical records. I presented evidence of alteration of medical records when I initially filed my complaint. This evidence was obtained in discovery during the malpractice action I brought against Dr. Carolyn Chang. Dr. Chang admitted to altering a key document in my medical record during the deposition. This was presumably done for the purpose of hiding evidence of wrongdoing. Business and Professions Code Section 2262 reads as follows. Altering or modifying the medical record of any person with fraudulent intent or creating any false medical record with fraudulent intent constitutes unprofessional conduct. Such conduct is also a misdemeanor under Penal Code Section 471.5. Despite this evidence, my complaint was closed by the expert reviewer at the Central Complaint Unit. Why was that expert allowed to ignore my evidence? I told the analyst handling my complaint about the alteration of records, and I even wrote her and her supervisors a letter about it. I presented enough evidence to meet the threshold hurdle that a likely violation of the Medical Practice Act had occurred, and my complaint should have been forwarded to the investigation unit. However, my case was closed, and the letter I received had a cryptic statement stating that they reviewed the issues raised in my complaint to assess whether a possible violation of the Medical Practice Act had occurred, and quote, based on the information provided, it was determined that further review would not result in disciplinary action being taken against the doctor, 
Close quote. It appears that the board is ignoring crucial evidence given by the complainant and improperly closing complaints at the central complaint unit. When I discussed the closure of my complaint with Kathleen Nichols, she told me that my case should never have been closed because of the evidence I presented regarding the alteration of my records. Kathleen Nichols herself oversaw the investigation and recommended that Dr. Chang be prosecuted by the Attorney General for this and another violation and not be allowed to settle the case. The case was referred to the Attorney General and the Attorney General, Attorney General refused to take the case. No one will give me an answer why. Your former, former Deputy Chief of Enforcement who reviewed my case file after it was closed and advocated to get my case reopened told me that the Attorney General typically will not prosecute a case based on an alteration of medical records unless there are other violations of the Medical Practice Act. So what's the point of having these laws if the agencies charged with enforcing them can Please ignore conclude. them? You've created an environment where doctors know that they can falsify their records to protect themselves and there will be no repercussions. The Medical Board and the Attorney General must explain to the legislature and the public Tapas, why they're failing to enforce these laws. No meaningful sunset review can happen without address. Thank you. Do we have any more public commenters on the line? All right. Um, just looking here in the hearing room, is there anyone else who wishes to make a public comment? Please. Please come forward. Now, where would you like to leave? Oh, thanks. Right here. Oh, I couldn't even see who was talking. <laughs> How is everybody doing? We're, we're great, thank you, how are you? God bless everybody. I have a question, and my question is, if a second autopsy is performed and the ER physician remains unreachable, first through not being listed through the medical board, then later having a listing but still is unreachable, even with the hospital facility, what is the recourse in order to have the autopsy changed? In, in other words, they, they put down COVID and pneumonia and it was an accidental fall. And so how do you get that changed? I'm, doing, I'm speaking on behalf of my mother-in-law because she was a school principal and her husband worked for AT&T Teletype. They've had my husband insured since for over 50 years. But then when they came and said that it was COVID and pneumonia, that cut out the accidental, um, uh, uh, you know, the double and triple indemnity, in other words. So how do you go about, if you can't find the doctor who said that it was COVID, how do you go about getting this resolved with the new autopsy? Ma'am, we'll have to talk Offline, this you have three minutes to give a public comment, but it, it sounds like you need to talk with medical board staff about your situation. Oh, you can't ask a question in the comment? We, we can't give a back and forth, and oh. it's something that we need to, to have more information on. Well, with whom should I speak offline then? Uh, I'm happy to talk with you once we go to break, which will be shortly, Very and I can give you my card. All righty, God bless everyone. And just don't, well, I will make a comment. There are different trees and flowers and ants and elephants, and everybody is supposed to be different. So when God made each of us, he said good and very good. Everybody is wonderful just as you are. God bless you. Thank you. All right, are there any additional public commenters in the room? All right, seeing none, we'll bring this uh, back to the board. I, I just want to start with one um, question because we were hearing um, a fair amount of public comment uh, about the DCA prioritization guidelines. Um, I know the medical board has statutory prioritization in Business and Professions Code Section 2220.05. Is there any reason why, though, the two conflict? And I guess maybe, Carrie, that's a question for you. You may not be able to answer it right now, but is there any reason why we couldn't, as a board, simply adopt the, the DCA prioritization guidelines, which, as I read them, it looks like um, I mean, maybe the only difference is that the DCA guidelines explicitly say that certain cases go to investigation, which B and P uh, code section 2220.05 does not appear to say, it just it establishes priority. I think that 
issue is Business and Professions Code Section 2220.08, which requires in quality of care cases that the matter go to a medical consultant who does an initial review and if the consultant doesn't find that there's reason for it to undergo a further investigation, then it's closed at that stage. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions, comments from board members? Uh, Dr. Thorpe? Uh, I did have a question about, I, in our, in our um, enforcement section of the, uh, of, of the new issues on section 12, um, I, I didn't see, you know, I know we're, we're developing under the, um, under the strategic plan, the issue of a complaint, uh, the, the uh, complainant's uh, input into the process. Um, it, it, is that, I just didn't see it in the enforcement section. Is that because, I know there was another part where we were talking about, um, you know, a, Developing a com uh, complainant uh, unit um, is that is that would that be the same thing? That's what, I guess that's my question. Uh, the second question I have, and just maybe you can answer both these, Aaron, is that under the uh, under the attempt to try to increase the ability to obtain medical records, there is this section about um, uh, investigatory uh, authority mm -hmm. to in to investigate without a medical consultant's um, oversight, is that correct? I, I guess my only question is, it just, it, it does seem, what, what, is, what is the control on the, on the investigation unit? Is there any control at all or is it totally up to their discretion? That seems a little bit broad in terms of just, uh, you know, rights, you know, rights of privacy and business to me, but I'm just asking. Um, thank you, doctor. So the, f your first question about the complainant liaison unit is in, it's in this document. It's not under the enforcement section. It's under the administrative proposal section. So that's on page 166 of part two, section yeah, 12. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So it begin, it begins there. Um, with regard to the enhanced record inspection authority, um, I guess a couple things come to mind. First, that's been a that's been a board proposal, I think for about two years or so. But with regard to balancing, I think I heard you say talk about balancing rights of you know privacy and that sort of thing. So the 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 authority that we are seeking is one. It's comparable to other authority that the Attorney General's office has to investigate Medi-Cal related fraud and Medi-Cal, you know, in abuse cases. So it's not really groundbreaking from that standpoint. Um, the purpose of that, and, and Ms. Webb could, could probably articulate it better than I can, but the purpose there is to give the opportunity to board staff and board investigators to do at least an initial inspection of records to see if good cause can be determined for a subpoena. So it's a kind of a, a preliminary step before we might pursue a subpoena if we don't have consent from the patient to, um, to get medical records. Um, if the subpoena was, was resisted and fought in court, well then the, you know, the judge in that case would, would, would balance out the competing interests, you know, the state's right interest versus privacy and, and come up with a determination. I hope, hope that's helpful. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Helzer. Uh, thank you. I have a follow-up question for Ms. Webb. Um, regarding the, uh, if we were to adopt the DCA uh, guidelines for prioritizing uh, complaints, how many additional investigations would ensue? Have we estimated that? Well, adopting their guidelines wouldn't change anything because of that other code section. And I think it would, it would definitely be a resource issue because uh, with quality of care cases, uh, they're getting an initial look by a medical consultant at the uh, central complaint unit level. And if the uh, 
consultant finds that there's just one simple departure that is insufficient under the law to take action and it's closed or if there's no violation found it's closed at that time or if there's insufficient evidence it's closed at that time if there is evidence that shows it should have further investigation then those cases are referred to um, the field for investigation with the health quality investigation unit so it's that quality of care uh, initial review that would have to change and it would be a, a massive increase for field investigations if that initial review isn't conducted. I, I, I can't give you a, a number sitting here today, but I imagine it would be significant. Thank you. Additional questions, comments? Ms. Wan. Mr. Watkins. I think it's kind of interesting that you know, the, the challenge I faced from the beginning when I started this process was how to approach this, you know, because it doesn't matter how I would have approached this, I think the result would have been the same. And I say this really believing that. Here's the issue why I say that. I hear the same story over and over and over again. I hear it's going to take resources, money. It's going to take more time. It's going to be hard. All of it. I want to share an experience with you. You know what's hard? Bearing a kid. That's hard. Taking care of a loved one that is not able to take care of themselves. That's hard. This stuff that we do. It's challenging in the course of life, but it's all doable. What I see is that so many ways I've seen just this morning was fine to disqualify the public. You are disqualified, by the way. And I just have one thing to say. I want to apologize to all these people that I created false hope during this process. I did, and I own that. I created the sense in them that everybody here would give it a, a sincere consideration. I would let them determine if such a consideration was made. I don't mind you marginalizing me. I lived in a country that marginalized me most of my life. But when I live in America, my standard wins on. And so today, you know, we're going to vote on this thing. And I will continue to do what I, I do. Because for me personally, I'm committed to changing this. Whatever it takes. Thank you. Thank you. Additional comments? So Dr. Hawkins. So in the, uh, the current center report, uh, and I realize the, we don't actually have the, um, the particular unit established yet, but the idea of transparency and the complainant being aware of the status of their complaint, does that, as we see it, does that allow the uh, complainant to be aware very early on about the status of their complaint, like in the CCU status. Um, just I'll, I'll end at that question. Did, does the proposed um, change in transparency, uh, transparency and allow the complaint to know the status in real time? Does it start in the CCU? Right, or we're so not that far yet. Well, I think that we, we did speak, and maybe Mr. Brown, you can speak to this too, about the specifics of the complaint liaison unit at our last board meeting, or maybe the previous one. Um, but, and now we're requesting the resources to actually be able to create that unit, right? Um, and so I guess I'd have to, I'll have to pull up the section of the 
report that speaks to it, but we're just, I believe at this point we're requesting the resources so we can stand that unit up and then make the things happen that we all talked about making happen. I, I have some questions, I mean, kind of along the same um, lines maybe is where you're headed with, with some of the, uh, I guess some of our policies, which I actually don't think are, are necessarily, necessarily need to be sunset review priorities, but actually our policies that we should evaluate. I mean, for example, I heard yesterday there may be an issue with our complaint box, the, just the form on the website, that people don't fill that out. You know, it looks like a box, and so people don't fill it out completely, and then they, they, they expect or make an assumption that we're gonna follow up with them, right, to get more information. I, I think that's something we need to think about, whether we're actually creating some type of barrier to investigation of the complaint just by virtue of our website form. Um, and that, that actually seems to me, too, to be a complaint liaison type issue that the unit could handle, right, that type of follow-up to make sure they've provided all the information. Um, and then also some of the other um, uh, issue areas about, you know, interviewing a complainant before a quality of care complaint is dismissed, also allowing things like victim impact statement. Um, I don't know that those need to be our uh, sunset priorities because I don't know that they require a legislative change. I, I believe some of those require a policy change and that the complainant liaison unit is the right place to make that change. So in some sense that we might be facilitating, if we can get the additional resources, if we can get the additional resources from the legislature to create the unit, we can tackle some of these um, things. That's why, you know, I, I know there's a great deal of frustration. I know these big proposals. Um, um, I, I, I understand that we want to head in that direction, but the way these processes work can be iterative, right? We can't, if we don't get the resources to create this unit, we're not gonna be able to do some of these things that people really, really would like to see happen. And I'd like to make, make, be able to make these requests of the legislature to get the complaining liaison unit, for example, stood up. That was a proposal, by the way, that, that came out of um, our sunset review process a couple years ago when um, it was Center for Public Interest Law had an ombudsman proposal, if you'll recall. Um, we thought about, we considered, it was actually part of the sunset review package. And, and so that's, this, again, it's an iterative process. Here we are with a you know, proposal now. We spent a lot of time thinking about it, two board meetings um, just this year, and we're making that request, hopefully, so we can get the resources so we can implement some of these um, changes. Aaron, I don't know if you have anything else you'd like to add. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure what the question is might, might be, Madam President, but I, yeah. but I guess what I was, um, I think Dr. Hawkins was referring to, yeah, both the unit and then as well as the online complaint tracking system. And right. so I think if the question is, is that intended to provide more transparency and more real-time information to complainants about the status of their complaint, I'd say, yes, absolutely. That's the, that's the purpose. Um, we're, I think, putting together some, you know, in, an interested parties meeting or two in order to, um, you know, gather additional, you know, input before the requirements get finalized for that program. Um, and then it gets developed, but but I think that's precisely the goal, Doctor. I would agree with Ms. Lawson, though, that uh, the unit itself may take some time, and so we yeah. probably would, to the best of our ability within resources, want to make that happen sooner rather than later, Not maybe not depend on that whole process being developed. But Maybe uh, I can shed some light on this as well, since I spend so much time on it. There's a difference between a policy and a legal right to a process. Right now, there's actually a section, and if I had my book here, I would have quoted the section, that actually requires the board to submit these letters at the beginning and at the end of the process. We know that is not, there's actually a section, law, legislative law, that says that board needs to do that. And we don't do that. And Jenna admitted that at the last uh, Sunset Review. We don't do that. That's legislation, so we're breaking the law, right? Under Section 2330, there's also a condition on the, on the Attorney General that prior, before a proposed settlement is given to the, uh, the doctor, the patient are informed of that proposed a law. We don't apply it. 
So when people ask and talk about, you know, all these different, you know, let's do this committee, let's do this uh, complaints liaison, and you don't want to put it in a legislative form where it becomes law that you have to do it, then it becomes discretionary. And this is the pattern at the Medical Board of California. When it's discretionary, it has never, ever worked out for the public. We are going to get rejected. We've gotten rejected today at the front end of this meeting. That will continue until we change the laws. I'm only interested in the laws. I'm not interested in all these little things that we put in place. We are at that stage, but nobody's going to see this until you see it. I, 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 and people like to say, oh, you're so ahead of the process. You're so, you're so, you know, you spend so much time on it. That's our job, to get informed. And it's easy to dismiss all of the stuff that we've done because that's how we do it. But there's going to be a time. And that time is going to be now, maybe not today. I'm a little sad that it is to not today, but you know what? Disappointment, setbacks, sets me up for my comeback. Are there additional comments or questions from board members? All right, just before we go to a roll call vote, um, I do want to note where there are some real areas of alignment between Mr. Watkins' proposals, between those um, that we seem from Consumer Watchdog, and, and um, I mean, those include things like updated mandatory reports, uh, the public member majority, which we continue to support. It's in there, it's not a new issue for us. We supported it last year, and in fact, sponsored some legislation that unfortunately did not get uh, adopted by the legislature. Uh, we certainly all support increased funding, which frankly I believe needs to be our biggest priority this year because it takes an extraordinary amount of, of time and energy to have to repeatedly, you know, participate in fee studies, compile that information, the numbers of meetings that take, have to take place between DCA and the Medical Board of California, the administration and various stakeholders just to, I mean, really kind of <laughs> sing for our resources um, is taking away from all of the good work that our staff does. Uh, we really need to figure out how to get this right this year. I, not only does that mean a fee increase, it all, which is, is a very important component of that in my opinion, but it also means, you know, whether it's some type of uh, escalator, I know we're proposing, um, you know, uh, regulation or what have you within 10%, um, something ongoing so we don't continually have to go back and beg for more money just to fund our operations. It's incredibly um, problematic, incredibly um, time consuming. And I also wanna highlight um, you know, what I think is, is really probably one of our most, uh, I guess, progressive uh, proposals, which is the change to the evidentiary standard to preponderance of the evidence. Um, and again, that didn't find its way into legislation last year. It was something that we proposed as part of our um, memorandum. I know that it's something that is important um, to consumers. It's really important to the board. And we're going to continue to try to push for those um, things. But I, I do hope that as part of this process, we can be realistic about what the process actually is, right? We're a board. Uh, we're supposed to be comprised of 15 members. We're down three. There's three vacant um, positions currently, um, and so we have to come to agreement about what our priorities are as a board, and we have to go through the process, which is these types of meetings. We also have to go through the process of presenting them to the legislature. Uh, we did that last year, right? I had great hope at the beginning that we were going to be successful, um, and we spent a, a uh, tremendous amount of time. I mean, thank you, uh, Aaron, but Dr. Hawkins and I, too. Um, because the authority was delegated to us, spent a tremendous amount of time working with legislat legislators, had, again, public member majority as an example, had a bill um, sponsored, uh, and we couldn't, we couldn't get that done, meaning the legislature didn't want to approve it, notwithstanding that we desperately wanted it to be approved by them. Um, so I just want us to be realistic about what we can accomplish, right, and, and go through these iterative processes. I know it can be frustrating. 
I know all of us would like to accomplish things um, overnight, but um, I, I can assure you that we're all committed to advancing our mission. Um, this is one step in the process. And you know, I, I look forward to having continuing conversations on a variety uh, of these issues. I look forward to finding a sponsor for our sunset legislation. We're gonna need, um, uh, excuse me, a, uh, an author, not a sponsor for our sunset legislation. I look forward to um, finding that author um, and being able to move this forward. So I know we have a motion pending um, to approve our sunset report as uh, written. Uh, the only thing that I think was missing from that was delegated authority to Dr. Hawkins and to myself as the board president and vice president just to make some, I guess, final conforming changes or that sort of can thing I, and then work with Mr. Can I make uh, a comment Mr. before Bung. we go on board? Yes, please, Dr. Yeah, Ramon. Yeah. Um, this has been quite a discussion today, and um, uh, I believe, um, as I said before, not everything I agree with what Mr. Watkin has written, but it's a tremendous work done. And we have a lot of discussion done, and this is going to be a very useful thing a month from now. Is it possible that instead of voting today, we give board another week to go through all these things, and we do in a virtual meeting and do a vote on that, and if there is anything compelling in the thing, we can include that uh, in this uh, whole thing. What are our noticing requirements, Carrie? I think we have at least a 10-day noticing requirement, correct? Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Be so we would need... Uh, one, to complete the work, have a 10-day noticing requirement, and I'll be honest with you, I don't believe that can be achieved between now and um, December, excuse me, January 3rd. We have 30 days time. If there's anything can be done, it'll be helpful because we hear overwhelming response from Watchdog, from public, from everybody, and the work which I have, I have reviewed his work uh, very diligently over last night. I spent two, three hours on that. Um, but if there's a possibility, that would be great. Well, what I'd like to propose is that, um, so again, I, I, I think there already in the Sunset Report is significant alignment. Of course, not all of the proposals are included, but point, I think there's point significant of order. alignment. I'm sorry, just a minute, let me finish. Um, and then I'd like to propose, I mean, we have a, a, a another agenda item, future agenda items. Some of these things I'd like to come back for further discussion at our next board meeting. Some of them are gonna come back in the context of the strategic plan, but I think we can pull some of the ideas out, um, you know, including the one I was just talking about, about why there's not alignment with the DCA prioritization guidelines. That's something that would require us diving into that, really understanding it, but it could come back as a future agenda item at our February um, board meeting. Point. Uh, Dr. Thorpe. We have a motion on the floor. Correct. Um, either it needs to be amended to make any change or we need to vote on it. Right, I, I just requested an amendment to provide delegated authority to Dr. Hawkins and to myself. So, okay, that- So I, moved. Okay. Madam so President, if any I- Any further discussion? Madam President, I have a, I have a clarifying question. Please. So on the, on the topic of prioritization of the goal of the board's requests, um, I wasn't sure if there was a, a consensus on that point or if that might be something that the board was looking to delegate to the president and the vice president on what those matters may be as we get into the legislative session and items get discussed and negotiated and whatnot. As part of my motion to amend, I would, uh, I would add um, deference to president and vice president uh, Lawson and, and Hawkins to prioritize the, the agenda for the Sunset Review. Okay, okay. And I just wanna clarify, because Dr. Hawkins made the initial motion and I believe Dr. Helzer seconded it, so are you both okay with now Dr. Thorpe making this new motion? So you've withdrawn yours and Dr. Thorpe gets to make his motion and Dr. Hawkins is seconding it. Yes, I accept the amendment. Okay, so in terms of procedure, we have a motion um, and a second. We've made all the necessary amendments, so I think unless there's further comment, we're ready for the roll call vote. Ms. Lopez. Dr. Ballat. Yes. Mr. Brooks. Dr. Hawkins. Yes. Dr. Helzer. Yes. Ms. Zhang. 
Ms. Liliano? Because I think more time should be given to this, uh, I can't vote um, yes, so I vote no. Dr. Mahmoud? No. Mr. Wu? Dr. Sai? Yes. Dr. Thorpe? Yes. Mr. Watkins? No. Uh, Ms. Lawson? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. All right, we are uh, going to take a um, short break because we still have a fair amount of board business to conduct, but we need to take a break. Um, I'm going to propose that we come back at 10 minutes after 1, so at 1.10, which is a 20-minute break. Ms. Lawson, do you want to do the future agenda items first and then do the break? Or? We can do that. We can okay. do that. You want to do that? Okay. Let's do that. That makes more sense. Thank you. Uh, we'll keep going. Agenda item 18, do any members have requests for future agenda items? Uh, Dr. Sure. Thorpe? Um, I would just like to reiterate, <clears throat> I have I've requested um, several times for, um, we need some significant work to be done coordinating with the Board of Pharmacy uh, regarding especially our updated opioid task for uh, the work we're doing on the guidelines. And um, I don't know what the, I don't know if that needs to be an agenda item, but I would like to make sure that we don't, that we, that we have an agenda item on, on, on the outreach needed to be done to implement the guidelines. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Sai? Yeah, um, obviously, um, Mr. Watkin has spent a, a tremendous amount of time on this, and I like to hopefully, uh, put this as an agenda item for our future meeting to look at the items that are same. And like Ms. Luviano said, a side-by-side -side comparison, is there something that uh, it's already been addressed, it's something that's you know legally impossible or uh, whatnot in terms of the uh, uh, Mr. Watkins proposal? I think that would help uh, as, a, as a new person on the board to see what are the the things that we need to work towards or what has already been incorporated in our current sunset proposal. So I'd like to put that on the agenda. Thank you. Additional agenda items? I would second that. Thank you. Ms. Luviano? Um, just thinking along the lines of, of DEI, I'd like to request uh, a presentation or information about uh, neurodivergence and neurotypicals and how that fits in, you know, whether a person is diagnosed or not, you know, within the doctor-patient relationship. Great, thank you. Mr. Watkins? I would like a presentation from an uh, expert that I'll recommend uh, f for giving us a presentation on the role of a board member, uh, the role of a board member acting in the interest of public. There's a, there's a person in Washington, D.C. that specializes in that. So I'll just pass that on. Okay, if you could forward that name, that'd be helpful. Additional, uh, Mr. Uh, excuse me, Dr. Helzer. I hope we can reschedule Ms. Jones' presentation on mandatory reporting for a future meeting. Yes, uh, so that will come back at our um, at our next meeting. I hope, right? Um, so unfortunately, that needed to just be rescheduled due to illness. But that's uh, that's important. That's something that came out of our um, last meeting. I just just on the issue of evaluating. Um, uh, the proposals that, that we received in advance of this meeting. I am really interested in this issue about uh, the DCA prioritization guidelines and the conflict that exists currently between Business and Professions Code 2220.08 um, that actually provides a separate process. And so I'd like to understand both, um, I guess, the legislative history, the reason why that, that um, difference exists and then uh, figure out if there's something that we can do about it if, it, if it can be resolved without legislation or if it actually needs to be resolved um, uh, with legislation. So I'd like that to come back at our uh, meeting potentially. All right, uh, if there are no further future agenda items from this group, we'll open it up to the public for comment. Is there anyone in the room who'd like to make a proposal for a future agenda item? I'm not seeing any. Everyone's okay? Um, uh, all right, let's go to the uh, phone, please. 
We have four public comments for future agenda items on the phone. Oops, something's wrong there and we can't seem to hear. Go ahead, try again. Oh, hello? Oh, okay. Um, I would rather be anywhere in the world besides here at this moment. And what has brought me here today is the worst nightmare a parent can face, the death of their child. It's a nonstop painful nightmare, and that's the reason we are all here. It's about how our children and family members die due to medical negligence or malpractice needlessly, and those negligent doctors who walk away with no accountability or even a record of what they did. It might be too late for my son, but what about the next child or your child? The Emp, do you have a future agenda away. item? The agenda item we're talking about right now is number 18, future agenda items. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I was talking about the other one. I'm sorry. It's just that I pushed the star one and um, I wasn't able to get through. Okay, go ahead. For agenda 17. Go ahead. Okay, sorry about that. Um, okay, so the medical board lets doctors walk away. The negligent doctor who treated my son walks into the next patient's room to treat your child as if nothing happened. Negligent doctors kill many children and injure many other patients, and no one ever knows there's even record of these incidents. We are real people with real lives. The only thing that is clear to me is that these negligent doctors saw my son, and I have no idea how to go on without him. There is no profession that has no accountability as to doctors. Selected leaders have allowed us to suffer. It's only about protection to themselves and with their peer review. Thank you, TJ Watkins. You're amazing. The next good. commenter, please. Do we have another commenter for future agenda items? Four more? Okay. Next commenter is Virginia Hildebrand. Your line is now open. Hi, this is Christina Hildebrand, not Virginia Hildebrand. I assume it's me and not Virginia that's supposed to talk, so I'm going to go ahead. Um, I have a number of future agenda items. Um, the first one is you have a meeting on September 14th for special facts. Can you hear me? There's a lot of background noise. Uh, just give, give us one minute. It does seem like there's something funny. All right, try again. Hi, this is Christina Hildebrand from a voice to first app. So there's a lot of feedback. I don't know if it's not on my end because I'm the only thing I'm on is my phone. We don't have background, so it, that, there might be something on your end. Okay. You want to go ahead? All right, I'll just go. I'll just keep talking. Um, uh, so Christina Hildebrand, the voice for choice app. Um, you have a meeting on December 14th scheduled for a special faculty permit review committee that has no agenda associated with it. I would request that you change that meeting to a legislative sunset review meeting because you are running out of time on both of them. For the legislative uh, initiative, all legislation has to be authored and put in place by uh, February 15th, it's before your next meeting. So any of this legislation, like the DCA code stuff, if you want that run this year, you have to find an author and you have to get it done before February 16th. So I, I would ask that you have a meeting prior to January again. Um, I would like to see on the future uh, future agenda, which I've asked time after time, a meeting on the standard of care. You had a, you had a presentation, I think probably a year or two years ago, on standard of care that didn't really do it um, and didn't really come to any conclusions. You just had a presentation and did nothing about it. Um, I would like that to, to really drill down on what is the definition of standard of care. I've also asked time after time that one session or one piece, one agenda item on every board meeting, quarterly board meeting, be handed over to a public advocate to present something, a topic that they wish to present on. So whether it's liposuction or, you know, debt baby deaths in Bakersfield or standard of care or whatever it is that one of your agenda items, give us an hour, let us submit our presentation to you and you pick one, but every single agenda, every quarterly board meeting should have one presentation from a public advocate. Um, 
And then I would also like to put on the agenda the CMA and how the medical board can gain enough power in the legislature that the CMA doesn't knock down every piece of legislation that you put forward and completely gut everything that would be patient-oriented. Thank you. Thank you. Next public comment, please. Next public comment, please. Hello? Please make your public comment. So we have them go on to the next person, please. Next commenter, please. It's just disconnected. Nobody else in the queue. Okay, there's nobody else in the queue at this point. Um, okay, we have two other people who wish to. Do you have a, a future agenda item? Please come on up. I turned 70 about a week ago, so I, I'd walk a little slower than others. Let's see. Now, I wanted to find out, as far as this author for the sunset legislation, what, um, is there a place to apply to do that? And then along with that, uh, or, or how you're going to make it, uh, put it out how you can make it available so some of the seniors or even people who have worked in healthcare can actually apply for, for helping you with that type of thing. That's a comment. And the other one is, is would you consider uh, putting it into your paperwork that for the examinations of case, cases, you could work with students that are on grants with the college and retirees because they're physiologists, surgical nurses, ER doctors, CT techs, like I used to work in that. It's all kinds of people that are available that if you guys put the call out, you can get people to help with the process of examination. It doesn't have to cost a minute. So, uh, and then we could write up grant proposals and things and see what funding could come down in order to be able to get this done. You know, so it's, it's something that can be done. So I'm, I'm basically saying, you know, like I would love to help with the, uh, with the, your writing processes, but like, I don't know how to get to you. <laughs> and the other thing is, is that, you know, all these kids that are in college, uh, they can help with the examination processes and, you know, and then the, even the retirees, and it can, you know, be a family of people working together. Anyway, I'll get out the way. Thank you for your comment. Uh, we have one more public comment in the back for a future agenda item. Hello, yes, I'm Madeline Weisner with California Association of Licensed Midwives. We would like to request a presentation on licensed midwife licensees um, and our scope of practice, uh, as well as vaginal birth after cesarean, VBAC. We had a presentation a few years ago and it was fantastic, but there's been a bit of turnover, so. Great, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, any other requests? Any other requests from the board? Uh, I'm sorry, we now have three public commenters in the queue on the line. Can we open it for public comment? Are they coming? Okay. Uh, Ms. Lauren, your line is open. Hello? Please go ahead. Are you talking to me, Susan Lauren? Yes. Okay. Um, the phone is just doing weird things, so I didn't hear you. I have um, future agenda items. I'll list them quickly. Um, I think number one will be covered when we look at this Accountability Act, but I want to specifically look at the board experts and you I've presented repeatedly um, about Terry Dubrow and experts should not be able to let a civil jury know that they work for the medical board. This sways um, and biases a jury 
and we need to talk about that. Number uh, two, I want to talk about surgical battery and why, um, I mean, surgical uh, sexual assault is a horrible thing, and it's good that you're focusing on it, but surgical battery destroys lives, and it needs to be um, really referred to law enforcement because the medical board, and I am a case in point, as are many of the other callers, uh, this, this can't go on like this. Uh, you don't go into an ambulatory center, be put unconscious, and be just mutilated, and nothing is done. So I want to talk about surgical battery. Um, thirdly, Christina Hildebrand, who I have great respect for her speaking skills, and I agree with her that um, we should have public presentations. Um, as much as that may not appeal to doctors, this is the outcome of your work. And you really need to hear from people who are out in the field um, experiencing the outcomes of your work. And number four, of course, and Ms. Lubiano has um, um, requested it several times, as have I, not necessarily just liposuction, but um, adipose removal. This is not a good thing. It is scientifically, you, you know my stance on this, but it, it, this just can't go on also. You, you, you know, I was a, a licensed massage therapist for 25 years. There's no way that a massage therapist would be harming and killing people for no reason and get away with it. There has to be, I don't really understand why you keep ignoring it other than you want your doctors to keep making tons of money. It's not in the public interest. And I would like to present on this. Like, um, anyway, that's, that's all. Thank you for calling on me. Thank you. Next commenter, please. Next comment comes from Helena Patas. Your line is not open. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Just to let everyone know, there have been a lot of issues with um, the phone and trying to get into the queue. Um, I would like to have a agenda item put on for uh, specifically the alteration and falsification of medical records, how that evidence is interpreted and handled by your expert reviewers and the Attorney General's office. I presented all of that evidence when I filed my initial complaint with the Central Complaint Unit. I could not get any single person to take that seriously. Um, finally, once I was able to communicate with your former Deputy Chief of Enforcement, who was kind enough to reopen a very serious complaint, um, I discovered that your experts are not reviewing evidence. I sent a letter. I highlighted where to find it. Your expert refused, obviously refused, to look at that evidence. How can that be? There is this code section that requires discipline for altering medical records with fraudulent intent. You have created a environment where that evidence can be ignored. I'd also like Gloria Castro to address this. Kathleen Nichols ran my investigation. She found clear and convincing evidence for that in my case and the investigation that ensued, which included multiple interviews. As I understand, I do not know how many, but there were multiple interviews conducted um, during my investigation. So I'd like Gloria Castro to address this. How does the Attorney General um, address this falsification of medical records? I have discovered just one instance of discipline imposed for modifying a medical record with fraudulent intent. The doctor's name is Antoine Kiley and he was convicted upon a plea of nolo contendere of violating penal code section 471.5, a misdemeanor. All the doctor was given was a public letter of reprimand. Why was this case allowed to be plea bargained this way? 
I'd really like Gloria Castor to address this. Thank you. Next commenter, please. Next commenter is Dr. Ree. Your line is now open. Yes, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, firstly, what I want to do is to thank, clearly thank the medical board for sending to me your piece of legislation, liaison. Um, we are moving forward with the legislation in regards to mediation. So, that we will go through. Um, what we would are asking the medical board is to allow us to give a presentation on cost um, cost saving measures for the board. We are the only organization that uh, Mr. Watkins unfortunately did not meet. I have asked the master for emails to all the board members and uh, was not without giving them. So something is going on there, but um, I asked the medical board to please allow us the opportunity to show you uh, statistically how mediation is cost saving. It um, brings closure, it brings results, almost immediate results for the patient or more loved ones. In addition to that, we must move forward rather than just keep throwing money at a situation that does not work. Enforcement now does not work. Instead of throwing more money at it, which some believe is a solution, in fact, it is outsourcing. What um, you were not told was that the 24% vacancy rate that is in um, enforcement or in investigation is not due to, it's not generally due to um, employees moving to a different um, board offered more money. In fact, most of them have left the state of California. Um, and so for that reason, everything points to outsourcing. Outsourcing for many industries, many, many industries, not just here, but across the world, outsource. It's incredible. The um, paradigm that's already built in and has been used for the past 10, 15, 20 years. It is cost saving. It will allow for every single complaint to the medical board get addressed and a patient or the loved one can follow on their app where the complaint is. They can Conclude. also provide feedback on the quality of services they're receiving. And each, please every conclude. single complaint will be addressed. All right, let's move on to the next commenter, please. And will receive closure. Our next commenter comes from Virginia Farr. Your line is now open. Hello. I are the same as they always are. Prevention, talking for prevention, patient safety, trauma informed care, liposuction, and adding doing a study on the modularization of harm patients in the healthcare society, healthcare study, and do a study like what's prevented presented today. Everything Christina said, and oh, how do you deal with the CMA getting everything you do and overriding everything you do and being more powerful than you? That needs to be addressed, or all of this is just a waste of time. You're literally wasting all the day if you don't deal with that. And, uh, and the pain thing, too, like they go on front pain. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Do we have any other commenters on the line? Okay, is there one more commenter in here? Ms. Connect? Uh, I would like to respond to that. Just a minute, just start when you get up here. Okay. I don't know what, how big of a hurry you were in. Um, 
Yeah, I would think it would be great if you could add a transparency uh, agenda item for board members because I think that it's really important and I can't fathom that it doesn't bother board members that you don't have access to investigative reports when you're, when you're on a panel deciding the fate of a doctor. I think it's, um, you don't have any fact checks. So I would like to request that you discuss this issue of being, for the board members to be able to, to obtain original records, original complaints, and the investigative reports and anything that might um, help them not only have to depend on the DAG summary so that they can make up a, a fair and equitable decision on a case. Because that learning, learning that you have no transparency blew me away. I had no idea. I know I don't, but I didn't know that you don't. So I think that would be a great item. Thank you. Yeah, just to maybe put a, um, more, some more color to that, it might be helpful for us to talk about what the panels do and what that enforcement process looks like. Um, I just, I, I don't want people to leave with the impression that we don't have access to information or that we only have access to DAG memos as part of the um, process. So I think it'd be helpful for us to have a session at some point on what the process, uh, what the panels look like, why the panels are set up the way they are and um, as information. All right. Is that the last future agenda item? Any other comments or questions? Okay, we are gonna take a break. I'm gonna propose that the board take a 15 minute break uh, because our next um, agenda item is a closed session to conduct the annual evaluation of the executive director. Um, but let's take a 15 minute break. Let's be back at 1.30 for that.
All right, we're returning to the board meeting. Uh, we're moving on to agenda item 19, which is a closed session to conduct the annual evaluation of the executive director. So we're moving into closed session now. Thank you.
Thank you. All right, the Medical Board of California is returning to open session and the next item on our agenda is adjournment. Uh, before we adjourn, I just wanted to note that uh, we understand some of you may have had difficulties uh, with the teleconference system earlier today. To the extent you have comments that you'd like to share with the board, I encourage you to email those uh, comments in writing um, to webmaster at mbc.ca.gov. Um, and we'll ensure those comments get uh, to the board so they can be entered into the record. Uh, with that, thank you all for joining us in Los Angeles uh, or by teleconference. So we'll look forward to seeing you at our February board meeting. And this meeting is now adjourned at 2.34 p.m. Thank you all. <laughs>